Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. to introduce you to a proud father, a man who is pushing his daughter, Venus Williams, to be the best in the world. Good racket speed. Good racket speed, Venus. Speed that racket head up. Richard Williams, who supposedly bought a book or some DVD or something, and sort of said, I'm going to teach these kids how to play tennis in some really tough part of Los Angeles. Straight out of Compton. We grew up on Stockton Street, Compton, California, 90221. That's where we grew up. And I'm going to tell you something, there was nothing remotely unhood about it. You You got to win. No, you're going to win. Aren't you? You going to win for us? Good girl. That's all I'm missing. How do you feel when you're hitting the ball right now? Good, Daddy. How about your feet? Your feet moving well? No, Daddy. How about you? Yes, sir. Very good. What we want to do, you know, don't get excited. This is your game. Richard is going around and begging private country clubs like Riviera Country Club and others to give him their used balls. And he would then fill up a shopping cart in an old Volkswagen bus. We didn't talk on the phone. We didn't go to school parties and all that stuff. But somehow I don't feel like I missed out. I mean, there was probably a few things I wanted to go to, but I figured I wasn't going to go, so I didn't ask. And Anyway, most of the time I was at practice. She was... I guess the guinea pig, (laughs) in a sense. Venus, absolutely. There was so much pressure on her to become a great player. You know, Richard was was talking about it every single day to every every newspaper in the country. You know, so she definitely uh, she had it. She had it the toughest. If you down with your face flat like a 97 year old person, you'll never be a tennis player. Richard was very very protective. And he generally would never let anyone around the girls. He was extremely protective because he has seen so much. Richard Williams was from Shreveport, Louisiana, and uh, came from a very small town. And he was raised you know, by a single mother uh, who instilled in him some really great values. But the things that Richard saw transformed his thinking and his outlook. Uh, really on everything, and justifiably so. He had seen men beaten. He had seen, you know, people deny opportunity. He grew up in an era where, you know, uh, the colored only sign was standard. A lot of things went wrong here. Right here is where six or seven guys helped me down and actually took a, a nail that goes on a cross tie and nailed that sucker right into my leg. The reason they would do something like this is simply because I wouldn't call them Mr. And I don't think it was fair for me to call no one Mr. that always called me boy and nigger and always trying to kill me. Context of white supremacy. Gusty Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date Friday, October 10th, 2014. So I have been told uh, the audio segment that you heard from the documentary film Venus and Serena came out in 2012. Fascinating footage. If you want to uh, give it a look, Uh, Chris Rock, among many other uh, well-known Uh, folks, Bill Clinton, former president, racist suspect, uh, and many others. Uh, If you want to uh, check it out, lots of great archival footage uh, of Venus, Serena, Richard Williams, uh, Oracine Price, uh, and the whole Williams family. Uh, At any rate, uh, this is our fifth study session. Mr. Richard Williams, Black and White, The Way I See It. Uh, We are picking up on chapter 15 right at the end Uh, I can't give page numbers because I'm using the Kindle edition but we are at the uh, right probably a few pages before the conclusion of chapter 15 is where we'll be uh, picking up at this week Uh, I think last week some of our astute uh, listeners uh, were questioning uh, whether or not the ghostwriter 
uh, might have had an impact on some of the commentary that we're hearing from Mr. Williams, uh, particularly around uh, his association with uh, Christianity or uh, his religious or spiritual practices. That's going to be a big theme this week. So I out pay attention. Uh, we can exchange views on that. Uh, also, Keep in mind, uh, Jerry Curl alert that's going to pop up this week uh, in most interesting fashion, but uh, should be a hoot. Looking forward to getting started. We are now more than halfway through the book. Uh, Mr. Richard Williams, Black and White, The Way I See It, Context of White Supremacy. The next day, I took my second official tennis lesson. It was another disaster. I sprayed balls all over the place. I ran around like a fool. I missed ball after ball, as if my racket had no strings in it. Whenever I missed a shot, Oliver would yell, Richard, you're hitting like old whiskey. During one lesson, Oliver reached down to get a ball and his bottle of whiskey fell and broke. He walked off the court and sat down on a bench. I went over and sat next to him. I said nothing. I just reached inside my pocket and took out a $10 bill, put it in his hand, and closed my hand over his. He nodded gratefully, and we sat for a while. Richard, he said quietly, I've worked with a lot of young people, and a lot of my kids went on to college. Most of them graduated, and they still come back and see me every now and then. I feel so proud when one of my kids makes it through. I worked with two players from UCLA. One of the boys was white and the other one was black. Both of them turned pro and ranked pretty decent on the tour. That's great, I said. You know what's sad about it? What, I asked curiously. I expected the black boy to come back and see me, but he never did. Not one time after he turned professional. When he was interviewed, he never so much as mentioned my name. Don't get me wrong. It's not like I was looking for him to give me credit or anything. I just thought he would be proud to say he learned the game from an old black man in the ghetto. That would have been nice. I agreed. He played a tournament here one time and I bought myself a ticket and went to see him play. I stood out there waiting for him after the game with all the other fans, and he walked right past me. He looked me directly in the eyes and kept going. He didn't speak or anything. He was so serious looking. The funny thing about it is the white boy came back to see me several times. Once he came out and we hit some balls for old time's sake. That's amazing, ain't it? I guess people's just people he said with surprising gentleness in his voice. Time blew by, and soon I had only one lesson left with Oliver. When I missed the ball, he yelled, You're still hitting the ball like old whiskey. Afterward, Oliver and I sat on the bench, and I listened to him talk for the last time. He looked me up and down. You have great feet, Richard. I like the way you line your feet up behind the ball. That's the smart way to do it. Most of the people I work with have messed up feet, and that's why their games can't get no better. If you got bad feet, you got bad technique. I heard you learning how to play tennis so you can teach your children, but they ain't even been born yet. Man, Richard, you are something. I hope I live long enough to see your children make it. I said, I think they're going to make it too. Well, Every now and then, God sends somebody to show the world that anything and everything is possible with him. You believe in God, Richard? I nodded. I was raised in the Church of Christ, and my mama was a prayer warrior. She used to tell me God had a job for me to do. I laughed. I sure hope this is the job, because I'm definitely going to need him on my side for it. Oliver stared toward the sky for a moment and said, God is always going to be on your side. Just keep your eye on the prize. I thanked him and packed and stood up to go. With a smile on his unshaven face, Oliver stood, grabbed my hand and said, come back and see me sometime, Richard, but don't make no promises you can't keep. 
That was it. He let my hand go, went back to the court, and started hitting balls with his next lesson. The funny thing was that I disagreed with almost everything Old Whiskey taught me. I disagreed with the footwork because I had a basic conflict with the closed stance all the pros taught, but I had not yet perfected the open stance and the power and speed it would bring to women's tennis. But he had started me and believed in me and helped me reach a better level. Sadly, Mr. Oliver died a few years later, long before he could see the things he taught me blossom in my daughters. Still, I remember him fondly, and to this day, I hope he knew how much he gave me. Chapter 16 From that time on, tennis consumed me. It was a good thing I could manage my security company from home at night and had flexible hours during the day because I spent every other waking hour learning the game. I bought more books and magazines. My thirst for knowledge evolved into a tennis video collection and a library of books. All the reading and studying I did generated more questions. So I spoke with individuals from the National Junior Tennis League and the United States Tennis Association. A lot of the information I acquired made sense, but the major question I still had was the proper way the feet should go. Everyone I spoke to agreed that the closed stance should be used on both the backhand and forehand sides. How can you hit a ball north when your body isn't turned that way? I asked. The consensus was, this is the way it's supposed to be and the way it always will be. Maybe it was supposed to be that way for them, but I thought I had a better way. They were all climbing the same hill, the same way. I decided to climb my own hill. I decided the way to go was an open stance. I went to the park and hit ball after ball against the wall every day for a month trying to perfect my footwork. Consistency was the name of the game. The ball's speed off the wall forced me to get my racket back early and to hit under the ball. During my self-instruction, I also worked on getting my elbow up on every shot with a long follow-through. I also substituted a quick sideways hop and jump on the baseline that let me get wider, faster, and return sharp angled shots down the line for the side-to-side -side spider steps most instructors taught. After a month of practice, I got back on the court. I put on a pair of cut-off jeans, a faded, wrinkled t-shirt, and a pair of dirty tennis shoes without socks. If this attire was proper for a pickup game of basketball, it had to be okay for the far less physical game of tennis. After inspecting myself in the mirror, I sprayed some sheen on my jerry curl and patted it down. Not one string of hair on my head was out of place. Quite pleased with myself, I grabbed my racket and some balls and headed out. Whenever I drove through the city, people stared at me. Thanks to my 1975 Oldsmobile, the defective muffler was so loud it sounded like a tank. The headliner sagged in the middle of the roof, and the lights and the air conditioner had minds of their own. Sometimes they worked, and other times they didn't. I drove through the black ghetto neighborhoods of Watts, Compton, and Long Beach looking for tennis courts. I wanted to locate them so I knew exactly where to take my future daughters when I started training them. There were at least three or four tennis courts in every area I visited, and I made notes on all of them. I decided to try my skills on the courts in Linwood, a black ghetto area in South L.A. To my surprise, when I pulled into the parking lot, it looked 
like I was at a country club. There was an old Jaguar, an aging Porsche, a Mercedes convertible, a Corvette, a Mustang, and four Cadillacs, one Coupe de Ville, two Eldorados, and a Fleetwood. Linwood Park, being where it was, drew black players and was sad proof that most black people in the ghetto had better cars than they had houses. I half expected an attendant to run out and offer to valet park my car. I grabbed my racket and balls and walked to the fence enclosing the courts. For a long time, I just watched and listened to the players. They were the best dressed group of black people I had ever seen. The men had their shirts tucked inside their shorts, and the women wore extremely short skirts. Their tennis shoes were so clean they looked unused. All wore headbands and wristbands. Some men wore gold chains. One man sprayed sheen on his jerry curl hair, picked it out, and patted it before he went onto the court. The women constantly touched up their heavy makeup and reapplied fresh lipstick. I couldn't help thinking that no matter how they dressed, none of them would be permitted into any of Los Angeles's country clubs unless they were looking for a cleaning person or a caddy. It didn't take long to see they had everything except game. Most of them couldn't play a lick. Evidently, appearance was the shot of the day. Brother, why are you standing outside the fence? A man asked me, interrupting my thoughts. I'm just looking, I replied. You can come in, he said, and pushed open the gate. As soon as I walked onto the court, everyone stopped. I mean, they literally stopped playing and stared at me for a moment and then burst into laughter. Hey, man, my name is Professor, my guide said, and reached out for my hand and shook it. And this is Colonel. He introduced the annoyed-looking man next to him. My name is Richard Williams, and I was just looking for a place where I can come hit, I explained. Can you play? Colonel asked flatly. Because we take our tennis very serious, man. We don't like no rookies on the court. I'm probably not as good as you guys, but I hit the ball pretty decent. How long have you been playing? Colonel asked. I picked up a racket for the first time two months ago. I haven't been playing long, but I'm really beginning to understand the game, I replied. Colonel walked away without another word, pulling Professor with him, but I could still hear their conversation. Professor? I hope he don't think he's going to play on these courts. Two months? What can you learn in two lousy months? Colonel said in a belligerent tone. Shush, Colonel. Professor put his finger to his mouth. Look at it this way. We'll have someone we can beat up on all the time. I stood listening to these pretentious assholes talking about me like I was invisible. As far as I was concerned, just dressing like a tennis player didn't make you one. Professor and Colonel came back over. Colonel said, I think we'll let you play on this court. I snapped. You must be confused because I wasn't asking for permission. I walked outside the fence and watched. They had prehistoric strokes, horrible footwork, and no strategy. But they were so high class that after they played a set, they changed balls and tossed the old ones into the garbage. When they came off the court and gathered in the parking lot to laugh, talk, and brag, I went and took the balls out of the garbage. Everyone looked at me. One of the women asked in a high-pitched voice, What is he doing? Why is he taking those balls out of the garbage can? Someone replied, He can't afford tennis clothes, 
so you know he can't afford balls. As long as he's out here, we don't need a trash man. I walked past the group to my car. Before getting in, I called back. I'll see you tomorrow. The next day, I got a chance to play. The rule was you had to bring your own balls. I brought my 10 cent used ones. When I took them out of my plastic bag, Colonel yelled, I'm not playing with those old balls, man. If you don't have new balls, you can't play. I didn't say a word. I just stood on my side of the court, holding my racket in one hand and three old balls in the other. Let me know when you're ready, I said. After a few minutes, Colonel said, Okay, hit the damn ball, man. This is ridiculous. I don't know why they let you out here in the first place. We hit back and forth. During the warm-up, I didn't get a chance to hit many balls back because he kept hitting them hard or away from me. While he was hitting like a mad dog, I studied his strokes and footwork. In the middle of hitting, I asked, Why do you hit the ball with a closed stance? At first, he didn't answer. I asked again, Why do you hit the ball with a closed stance? I heard you the first time. That's the way you're supposed to hit it. If you were a real tennis player, you would know that. Besides, it doesn't matter how I hit the ball. I can beat your ass. We took some practice serves and I noticed he had a few problems. So I asked him, why do you stop the flow of motion when you serve the ball? And why do you toss the ball so high and then let it drop too low before you hit it? You'll never have a good serve that way. Colonel deliberately served a flat ball over the net so fast I didn't see it coming. Don't worry about my serve. You just worry about trying to return the fire. He laughed. We played and I lost 6-0, 6-0. Colonel rejoiced like he had just beat Arthur Ashe or Jimmy Connors. I didn't care. I was more interested in how my footwork should change to make the proper distance to the ball and not run into it or past it. Colonel explained, it won't make a difference because you can't beat me no way. I continued to come to the courts to play. No one was happy about my being there, but they were happy to play me. I lost to everyone, even the women. After three months of losing, I bought a big-faced racket and hoped it would help. One day, I played a woman named Jojo, and she hit the ball so hard I missed it. Jojo asked, how could you miss the ball with that big old racket? That's ridiculous. I was working on my open stance. She snorted. That's why you lose all the time, because you keep trying all that junk. She wasn't wrong. I lost all the time. Still, considering I only had my lessons with Oliver and my work on the backboard, I didn't think my losses were that bad. The guys at the park didn't agree with me. I lost so much, they made up a song. Someone's got to win. Someone's got to lose. Richard keeps losing because he's an open stance fool. I was also known for bringing my water in an old plastic gallon milk jug and never bringing a towel. I saw no need for a towel because I didn't sweat like the rest of them. When they played me, they did all the running. I usually stood in one spot and worked on one part of my game. A lot of hostility built up between us. It got even worse when they found out I was learning the game to teach my children who hadn't been born yet. One evening, after they gathered in the parking lot, they started teasing me about my dream. 
Richard mocked topspin. You really think you're going to have tennis champions? Man, that's a fool's dream. I can count the blacks who made it in tennis on one hand. What makes you think your children will be good enough? Colonel, who took every opportunity to insult me, added, The way you play, you couldn't teach your kids nothing. If you did, they would get beat up on just like you. It was then that a man named Nathaniel cleared his throat and said sternly, All of you guys laugh at Richard. You should go home and do the same thing. He kept on angrily. Tell me what black man you know plans for his children's future before they are born. Most black men just make a bunch of babies and don't take care of them. Richard is willing to sacrifice himself for his family. All of you are just a selfish bunch of niggers. The comments and jokes had only one effect on me. I was more determined than ever to improve my game. I would make believers out of everyone who said the open stance had no place in tennis. I stopped going to the tennis courts and began to practice again. Every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning before work, I hit 300 forehands down the line with an open stance. On my lunch break, I hit hundreds of forehands cross court. When I got off work, I hit 300 backhands down the line and then cross court all with an open stance. I hired kids to pick up balls so I didn't have to slow down. On Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, I worked on my serves and volleys. If it rained, I practiced in a gym with a secondhand lobster ball machine I bought. Hitting off the waxed hardwood floors was difficult, but it taught me a valuable lesson. How to get my racket back faster than anyone who played the game. Once I learned to control both forehand and backhand, it would be difficult to beat me. I also played basketball and baseball because these sports helped me see the ball early and throwing the ball helped my serve. Later, I would have Venus and Serena throw a football to strengthen those same muscles. I also believed balance was an important and underemphasized part of the game. To enhance my balance, I took dance lessons. At my first lesson, the teacher asked me to face her so we could dance. I put my left side to her front, the way you turn your body to hit a tennis ball. What are you doing? She asked. Getting ready to dance, I replied. She shook her head. No, no, no. You can't dance that way. Well, that's the way people hit a tennis ball, I replied. She sighed. I don't know anything about tennis balls, but I do know you can't dance with me if your side is facing me. It doesn't make sense. Let's try again. I turned my right side to her this time. She said, you're doing the same thing. It's just a different side. What are you trying to do? I replied, that's the way they do it on the tennis court. Mr. Williams, I have never held a tennis racket in my hand and I know absolutely nothing about the game. But I do know if you hit a ball that way, you won't have any balance. And if you have to run to the other side, you'll have a problem. To play any sport, you have to have good balance and great feet. I explained, I'm planning to teach my daughter's tennis and I want to make sure I understand how to shift my body from side to side, how to make explosive moves and keep my balance. Do you think you can help me with that? I asked. Do you have pictures or video I can study to see how you hit 
the tennis ball, she asked. Yes, I have something in the car. I'll be right back. I rushed to the car and brought back a video. She took the video out of my hand and inserted it in the VCR. We watched the tape and she made several notes. When the tape stopped, she nodded. Now I understand what you were doing when you turned to the side to dance with me. Everyone in the tape hits the ball that way. I'm surprised they don't fall on their faces. I think if you want to hit forward, you should face forward. The people in the tape face to the side. I saw something else on the tape, too. When they ran wide to get the ball, they were unable to recover because they couldn't shift their weight. On some of the shots, I think the hitter should have taken a bigger first step. I agree. I've seen that too. Would you like me to incorporate all of those things into a dance sequence for you? She asked. Yes, I would. I really would appreciate it, I replied. I'm going to include some special stretching exercises to make sure your muscles don't tighten up. That will help your flexibility. I smiled. That was music to my ears. Okay, then. I can meet with you one night a week in the evening, but a lot of it will involve practicing on your own. What night do you want your lesson? By the way, my fee is $15 a week. Wednesday night, I told her, and I took my first lesson that night and took one every Wednesday thereafter for almost a year. I have always believed that you can't know if a theory is correct until you test it. That idea served me well when the clan boys came for me and I learned how far I really needed to run to escape. It served me well in Chicago when I beat the cops who nearly killed me. And in Los Angeles, it helped me figure out how to get around Buddy and go into business for myself. An untested theory is like raw meat. You can't tell how it tastes till it's cooked. After three months of rigid practice, cross training and dancing, I was ready and eager to return to the tennis courts. I had my theories. Now it was time to test them. Chapter 17 when I drove back into the parking lot at Linwood Park, very little had changed. Professor and Colonel were playing doubles, and by the celebratory look on their faces, they were winning. Lola and Nathaniel played mixed doubles against Tina and Rudy, and more than once Lola's high-pitched voice filled the air. That ball wasn't out. Show me the mark, Rudy. You just show me the mark. In the months I had been gone, there were a few new faces, and with them, new attitudes. Truck was a tall brother who was at six foot eight, looked more like a basketball player than a tennis player. He covered the court extremely well, and his long wingspan and surprisingly quick feet made him difficult to beat. He played an aggressive serve and volley game and closed the point without concern for his opponent's safety. He'd take your head off with the ball if you came to the net. Omar was a college-educated brother who had fought in Vietnam. Since his return from the war, he had changed his name and become a vegetarian and an advocate for black issues. He was articulate, intelligent, and never backed down from a confrontation. It was no secret the group disliked me, but I honestly believe they despised Omar. Omar played in a dashiki instead of a regular shirt. Unlike most black men who had jerry curls, he had shoulder-length dreadlocks like woven rope. He lived in an old green army step van with a picture of Africa painted on one side and two black fists with the caption black power on the other. Inside, bookcases were filled with volumes on Africa, 
black history, slavery, segregation, poverty, education, sociology, and war. He had a television that ran on batteries, a small refrigerator, and a file cabinet. A sheet of psychedelic painted plywood served as a desk with a framed copy of his college degree on it. Up front, the driver's area was carpeted and the seats were covered in black fur. The veteran's disability check from the government was Omar's primary source of income. To earn additional money, he gave lectures at radical white college students' meetings. Omar's message was clear. He preached blacks should go back to Africa. The motherland was the only way we would ever truly know who we were as a people. He also claimed the reason blacks suffered from high blood pressure, diabetes, and other illnesses was the food we ate. The food we eat is traced back to slavery. The master got choice meat. We got the throwaway. If he killed a pig, he got delicious pork chops. We got the pig's guts or intestine, chitterlings, his tail, feet, and lips. If he killed a chicken, he feasted on the savory meat. We got the feet, neck, liver, and gizzards. We always got the scraps from the master's table, and from then until now, we're still eating scrap. He also believed blacks would always be oppressed and live in poverty and terrible neighborhoods if they didn't understand the power of a dollar. Black people spend a lot of money in this country buying everything, but we don't own anything. Look at all these people dressed up in those expensive tennis clothes. Where did they buy them? I'm willing to bet they left our community and took their dollars to the white man's store. The black man used to own stores, but now every other nationality is moving in and taking our money. Are we blind or are we just plain crazy? Whenever Omar talked that way, the group thought he was insulting them personally. It was interesting to me. As the years had rolled on, my ideas were no longer considered so crazy. More people were speaking the way I spoke and beginning to illuminate the real nature of the black race's problems in white America. On my first day back, I didn't play. I just watched. When I pulled into the parking lot the next day, Colonel came up to me. Richard, I saw you hanging outside the fence yesterday. I bet you were scared to come in because you thought you had to play me. I got out of my car, grabbed a racket and balls, and headed for the court. Colonel walked behind me and kept taunting. Look, everybody, Richard's back. Let's give him a round of applause. Everyone started clapping and laughing. Colonel continued in a loud voice. A lot of things have changed since you left. Do you want to play me, Richard? He asked smugly. Not today, I replied and went to hit against the backboard. See there, everybody? He's too scared to play. I was ready to play and I knew I would win, but I didn't accept a single game. I hit against the backboard and watched. Meanwhile, Colonel took every opportunity to agitate me and got upset when it didn't work. By the third week, however, I had enough. I walked onto the court and yelled over to Colonel. I'm ready when you are. Colonel grabbed his racket, tennis bag, and water jug and walked onto the court. Everyone stopped playing and came to watch. We hit a few ground strokes and I purposely hit every other ball into the net or out. Then I came in on a few shots and worked on my volleys. Are you ready yet? He asked. No, I want to hit a few serves and overheads. Take all the time you need. It won't make a difference because you're going to lose. After we warmed up, he took out a coin, 
heads or tails? You serve, I replied, and went to the baseline. Colonel's first serve was an ace. He started pumping his fist and saying, yes. His second and third serves were aces too. At 40 love, he served the ball to my forehand and I hit a cross-court winner. Lucky shot, he yelled. At 40-15, he served and I hit a backhand winner down the line. At 40-30, he served wide and I nailed it down the line. He just stood and stared. It was a deuce and he served. I stepped into the ball and hit a cross-court winner. At add in, my return of serve was a drop shot that forced him to run in. He got to the ball, but floated it back. I was already at the net, so I volleyed the ball past him and won the game. He was unable to handle my kick serve, so I held every service in the first set. My drop shots, lobs, slice, and angles proved too much for him. I won the first set six love. He was very quiet. I jumped up five love so fast in the second set, he looked like he wanted to throw his racket at me. I served for the match. After the third serve, I was up 40 love. Game, set, and match point. Colonel looked very serious. I served down the tee, and he couldn't get his racket anywhere near the ball. It was an ace and the match. I had beaten the loud-mouthed colonel, six love, six love. Someone started to sing and the song they wrote about me, but with different words. Someone got to win. Someone's got to lose. Colonel come off the court looking like a fool. I went to the net to shake Colonel's hand, but he refused. I don't want to shake your hand. You think you did something. You just got lucky. That's all. My game got better and better. Impressed by my ability, the group started to bet on my matches. They brought in players from other areas to play me. I encouraged that because I knew their games, so it was no longer a challenge. These courts were my first real training ground and my most consistent regimen. To be ready when the time came to train my daughters, I needed people who played better than I did to raise my game. To keep enhancing my feet, hand, and eye coordination, I took boxing lessons. The smell of the dusty, cramped room brought back memories of my earlier boxing days in Chicago memories I wanted to forget. I had trained at a local gym, hoping to turn professional. My reflexes were sharp, my feet were quick, and my hands were fast. For many young Negroes, boxing seemed to present a chance to escape poverty and oppression. For me, as for most, it was a pipe dream. Boxing demanded commitment, perseverance, stamina, strength, power, control, patience, tolerance, and focus. We were all just kids, foolishly convinced we were going to be the next heavyweight champion of the world. After six months of training, I fought my first fight. To say I was nervous and scared is an understatement. My opponent was three inches taller, outweighed me by 40 pounds, and was the meanest looking man I had ever seen. At the bell, he just walked over to the ropes and push-pulled his body back and forth. I wasn't sure what to do, so I waited patiently with my fists in front of my face. He yelled, Where did you get young blood from? Why do you keep putting these boys in the ring with me? Y'all know they can't fight, man. Damn. Okay, boy, I'm about to knock you out. I started bouncing around and moving from side to side to show him I wasn't a chump. I threw a right jab, and it lightly brushed against his jaw. I followed with a left jab that missed him completely. He hit me with a right uppercut, and the lights went out. I don't remember anything after that. To this day, 
I have no idea how I got out of the ring. When I woke in the dressing room, my trainer was standing over me. He dropped some money on my chest and said, Good fight, kid. Better luck next time. I told myself there wasn't going to be a next time, but I found myself back in the ring, still getting the shit beat out of me. One night, I got hit so hard, I flew over the rope, fell, and hit my head on a chair. It was enough. I was tired of getting knocked out in the first round. Boxing was a part of my life I did not want to revisit, but I was a man on a mission. This time around, I wasn't interested in getting in a ring. I was interested in footwork and hand movement. I videotaped various boxers, took the tapes home, and studied them until I mastered the movements. I bought a punching bag, hung it up in the backyard, and practiced. My height was a bit beyond six feet, and Oracine was a six-footer. I was pretty sure our daughters would be at least as tall. Height was a good feature. If tennis was a washout, they could become basketball players, a sport I loved far more than tennis anyway. But would they be true athletes? Some claimed athleticism was inherited. If that was true, I knew my daughters would be great. Oracine was terrific at sports, and I had always been a successful athlete. As a basketball player, I could shoot, rebound, dribble, and pass with the best of them. In football, I was as fast as the wind, and if anyone tried to tackle me, I blew right past him. My attitude was I could not be stopped. The same mentality I planned to instill in my daughters now that I had game enough to teach them. I was out to prove that in the upcoming 80s, powder puff hitters with lots of spin would no longer dominate women's tennis. The game would evolve. Unlike the past when big people couldn't change direction, stop on a dime, run or move well, I would introduce a new generation of players. Bigger, better, faster, taller. That was my idea. That was my plan. My daughters would inherit my knowledge and take the world by storm as soon as they were born. Chapter 18 To my eternal love and gratitude, Venus Ebony Star Williams arrived in this world on June 17, 1980, and Serena Jamika Williams arrived on September 26, 1981. I had my game and I had my girls. It was time to put them together. The trouble was, I didn't know that following my plan was about to expose us to the worst side of life and put our very lives in danger. I really had no idea of the hell to which I was initially co-signing my family or the pain I would suffer as a result. What I also did not know was that from here on in, tennis wasn't going to be a game. Not anymore. Not when you play it in the ghetto. In the third week of March 1983, I moved my family from Long Beach to Compton in South Central Los Angeles to a house I bought at 1117 East Stockton Street. It was a terrible change from the tranquility of Long Beach. Compton was lost in a murder spree that would last for 20 years and leave 1,397 people dead from gang and drug-related violence. It was a world of crime and bloodshed, and soon we were trapped in the middle of daily gun battles and shootouts. We quickly learned how to escape the bullets that flew through the air unconcerned about their next victims. We fell to our knees in the posture of prayer and crawled like defenseless children to safety. 
there is no real hiding place in a war zone. Gang members controlled the city and put its citizens under martial law. For almost all the senior citizens, it was total lockdown. The gangs preyed on their helpless victims through intimidation, threats, violence, and murder. They ruled the streets of Compton, shooting people without hesitation. Thugs commanded every corner, willing to kill or be killed just to protect their territory. Life had little meaning. People died just for the hell of it. What led me to Compton was my belief that the greatest champions came out of the ghetto. I had studied sports successes like Muhammad Ali and great thinkers like Malcolm X. I saw where they came from. As part of my plan, I decided it was where the girls were going to grow up to. It would make them tough, give them a fighter's mentality. They'd be used to combat. And how much easier would it be to play in front of thousands of white people if they had already learned to play in front of scores of armed gang members? Venus was almost three years old and Serena was nearing two. Before Compton, we were living about a block from the beach. It was beautiful. So when the family learned I was moving us, Oracine said, I'm not going to move to Compton. There's a limit, Richard. I told her she didn't have to move, but I was going and we could visit each other as often as she liked. In Long Beach, I was paying a huge house note of over $1,000 a month. In Compton, the house I bought was $25,000 and the monthly payment was around $135. That freed up a lot of money so I could spend less time earning and more time training the girls. We talked about it a lot and Oracine still didn't want to move, but my mind was made up. After a while, she decided she would move to Compton and asked me what the house was like. I did not want to tell her the truth. It was a mess. You have to see it for yourself, I said. When Oracine and the older kids saw it for themselves, only Lynn, Venus, and Serena didn't have a problem because they were too young to understand what a drop their lifestyle had taken. Oracine, Yatunde, and Isha balked major league. When Oracine saw people shooting up drugs and gang members standing on the corner, she refused to stay. She remained in Long Beach while I took the girls with me. Now, I had the type of environment I wanted, the kind I grew up in. I'd always felt that the ghetto makes you tough and strong, unless it doesn't do anything for you at all but get you killed. I needed to have my girls around kids who were already where I was trying to take them. They had to learn to be rough, tough, and strong. Anyway, that was the main idea for moving to Compton. The result? I got more than I bargained for. After two days in this hellhole, I was ready to move. I had never been in a war before. Here I was at 41 years of age and I felt like I had been drafted into the U.S. Army and dropped into hostile territory. Near as I could tell, Compton was held by the enemy, and the president and his cabinet were members of the most notorious and ruthless gangs in the nation. The president of Compton was too evil, a young man about 20 years old. His destiny was to be a gang member. His father, Evil One, and his mother, Angie B, were gang members too. When Too Evil was just four years old, he helped his dad in a robbery. Using his small size, he crawled through a window and unlocked the door so his father and his homeboys could rob the place. This was just the beginning of his downward spiral in 
and out of juvenile detention centers for crimes ranging from petty theft and burglary to strong arm robbery. A street smart, high ranking member of the Bloods and always a step ahead of the police, Two Evil ruled Compton. He used drugs like weapons. Rock cocaine was an explosive device, and heroin turned heroes into zeros. PCP was the mind destroyer, a drug so powerful it could tranquilize an elephant. It was one of the worst drugs on the street, and yet young men and women took it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, slowly destroying their minds and ultimately their lives. There was no law and order in Compton. A black girl was shot in the back of the head by a store owner who killed her for stealing a bottle of orange juice. Commerce was warfare. It was impossible to free the city from control by the Crips and Bloods who occupied it like a military force. Crime was central to life here. It took me only a couple of months to realize I was in the middle of hell and only God could help me now. I prayed without ceasing. I prayed hard that gangs would not kill my children. I cried to the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Despite my prayer, I did want. I was not content. I wanted to run. Yet, I wanted things to change. I wanted to make a difference. I didn't know how. It was easy to see I would need the strength of Samson, the courage of Daniel, the wisdom of Solomon, and the power of Almighty God to fight the gangs that infested Compton. In the depths of my heart, I wished God would rain down brimstone and fire and totally consume every gang member and cast them into the pits of hell. Maybe the police could line them all up and sentence them to death by firing squad. Kill all of the bastards. Was I insane? Were these the thoughts of a rational man? How could a man of kindness and humility change so quickly? I hated President Too Evil. He loved to ride in the neighborhood in his chauffeur-driven limousine. A crowd always surrounded the car and treated him like a foreign diplomat, which he was, because he was from East Compton. He was the government, and he got more respect in Compton than the president got in Washington. His bodyguards packed weapons and were not afraid to use them. They had an arsenal the LAPD was unable to match. To command respect, the bodyguards fired off rounds to see people crawl on their knees for safety. Many times, I was one of those helpless people desperately trying to escape the fire. Nobody in Compton was prepared to deal with the gangs because it was just too easy to get killed. Blacks, whites, Mexicans, teachers, preachers, deacons, church members, city officials, the police, and the sheriff's department, they all ignored the fact that Compton was in serious trouble. Many years before, I had battled the Ku Klux Klan, but this was going to be much tougher because I would be fighting my own people. Where did I start? Who would I get to help me? How could one man stand against a gangster militia? Was there anyone who gave a damn except me? My crusade began in earnest. My goal was to see not one more child killed in Compton. City Councilwoman Patricia Moore did all she could to help me, and we got to be friends. She was a hard worker, and I really appreciated it, but little came of our efforts. I visited more than 30 preachers, the police department, the city council members, and even the mayor to no avail. The mayor got so aggravated by my visits, he told his secretary to tell me he wasn't in. 
My face became a familiar sight, but pleas for help were hopeless. One day, I saw the mayor in the car next to mine, stopped at a red light. I yelled out the window, why don't you try to stop the gangs from taking over Compton? At first, he just stared ahead as if he was afraid to look my way. I repeated the question knowing he recognized me. He replied angrily, keep going the way you're going and you're going to be taken over too. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing anyone can do. When the light turned green, he accelerated as if a gang member was chasing him. I pulled my car over and cried. It hurt me immensely to see such a lack of concern. I grew convinced nothing and no one could change Compton. I decided to get out of this killing field where blacks had no respect for their own humanity. I rented a U-Haul and raced home to get my family packed so we could leave immediately. As we headed north on Long Beach Boulevard, I stopped at a light and looked over when a commotion started at a mobile gas station. Suddenly, a young man was shot down before my eyes. It was senseless. I could barely believe it. Yet at the very moment that ambulance and police sirens began to wail in the distance, I knew I could not leave Compton. I might die in the war zone because every evil force of hell existed all around me, but I couldn't run away and give up. Someone had to change the community. Someone had to give the children hope. I was willing to die to stay in hell. I would continue to run my security business and save money not to move out of Compton, but to remain in it. My decision to train my daughters on the courts of Compton was a battle not only for tennis, but for my very life. Going to the park was like going to Wall Street where bankers did business. Unfortunately, instead of bonds and stocks, they were pushing rock cocaine. It was sold on every corner, in every market's parking lot. The street vendors sold hot dogs and hamburgers from their carts and cocaine as a condiment. How could I train my daughters here? Context of white supremacy. We are at the beginning of chapter 18. Uh, I don't I can't give out the page number, but it should be just a few a very few pages into the early portion of chapter 18. That's what we'll be picking up at for the uh, second audio clip. Right on. Uh, if folks are interested in participating. The number to dial. Seven, six, zero. Five, six, nine. Seven, six. 76 The code is 564 943 pound Press star 6 if you would like to participate The number again 760 569 Seven six, seven six. The code is five six four nine four three pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. If you do not or don't have the uh, ability to use your phone or you don't you're not interested in using your phone to dial in you can use the free flash player it is linked uh, on the black talk radio page Uh, if you are not listening there you can just put in the following address which is tiny t-i-n-y dot c-c 
forward slash one race. And that is the number one. Address again is tiny, T-I-N-Y dot C-C forward slash one race. And that is the number one. Once you put in that address, click the link on the left side of the page that says uh, free flash player. Once you do that, it will open a small window on your screen uh, on the top line. It's a drop down menu. Select the number that I just gave out, which again is seven, six, zero, five, six, nine, seven, six, seven, six. The code is five, six, four, nine four three pound press star six or excuse me you know on press star six <laughs> just click the drop down menu the number I gave out then on the second line put in the code which is five six four nine four three that's all you need to do and that's on the second line so again the code is five six four nine four three and then the final line it will ask for a name you can click random keys, nickname, whatever you're comfortable with. Once you get that all filled out, again, first line, drop down menu, put in the number 7605697676. The code is on the next line. It is 564943. And then the final line, name, whatever you are comfy with. Once you get all that entered, click the green button at the bottom of the screen. It will connect you to the live broadcast. You should be able to hear us. If you would like to participate, it is the same procedure. You'll see the dial pad on your screen. Press star six. You should hear an audio prompt. Press the number one. And I'll see your hand on the switchboard. We'll be able to get you on the program. That being said, uh, we'll see if folks have things they would like to share. I think uh, I posted the link, the quote unquote, Jerry Curl alert. Uh, I posted uh, the link on my Facebook page uh, earlier today. Uh, The Mr. Comer Cottrell, hope I'm saying his name correctly, black male who made uh, Jerry Curl available to the masses. Uh, He just passed away this week, uh, a couple days ago. I thought that was uh, rather timely. They did a big piece on him in the L.A. Times uh, yesterday. You can check that out on Facebook. Anywho, folks that uh, are on the line, we'll go ahead and get the hands and uh, look forward to uh, constructive exchange. Uh, Everybody who dialed in with a hand up, line should be open and uh, feel free. Greetings. Greetings. Good to hear from you, sir. Yes, I, I was just uh, pausing to uh, see if anybody else was uh, was uh, going to speak up. But uh, anyway, uh, yes, uh, once again, uh, Mr. Williams uh, seems to be, you know, pretty down to earth guy. Uh, have within his consciousness that we are in a system of racism and white supremacy and he keeps that in mind with all of his daily functions it seems uh, I came in primarily uh, on your reading uh, with him uh on a continuous level, making his plans for uh, the children that he's going to have, uh, specifically uh, Serena and Venus, uh, to be stars, first by himself, preparing himself, as far as understanding and knowing the game. I'm seeing where, I'm seeing where the real-life person 
uh, is actually is creating the foundation of uh, to be able to coach his own children by first experiencing and understanding and knowing the game himself uh, through, I guess you can call it through trial and error in some cases, uh, where he was in these uh, matches with uh, other individuals and trying different things and seeing what works and what does not work, um, which is actually without him, I don't think too much reading any books on coaching is that is, is a real keen keen way of of uh, being able to distinguish. Okay, I can use this, you know, but not use that, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, he actually went through it himself, and uh, I find that brilliant, you know, on his behalf. It, 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 from from that particular portion of your reading, it really gives me a good idea of this person and how how he was able to develop his two children. Uh. I mean, I don't know if the right word is to say uh, 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 brilliant or expert, expert, but it's it's as close to it as I can think of something like that to be. Uh, also, from the standpoint with his uh, understanding of the 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 drive, the urge that it takes to be a top athlete. Actually, it's, 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 a, it's a drive and an urge to be the top in just about anything. And that was his, that was his uh, idea in mind when he moved the family to, uh, to uh, uh, Compton. Uh, and this, this is not the first time I've heard this. Uh, understanding from a non-white black person, uh, and, and it, it, it basically holds true from my experiences also as a uh, uh, athlete and a, and a uh, former athlete and a fellow uh, coach myself uh, in South Florida. Uh, football is like a religion, and the best football players in the world come from the state of Florida. Primarily, is measured from the transition from uh, high school to college, and also if you if if they make an item, itemization of the NFL rosters on the majority of the players that make up the players of the NFL come from the state of Florida. But what I'm saying about it is that the hunger by being in areas highly concentrated with non-white black people, of course, in this war of racism and white supremacy. We're not doing too well, and primarily as a byproduct of the system of racism and white supremacy, uh, we harm each other. That's a byproduct of the system of racism and white supremacy, which is war, and this is going to happen in war. And uh, Mr. Williams uh, was going to have the idea in mind of gaining advantage of this problem uh, in a constructive way, you know, with that desire that exists of those particular kids or children who or families who are saying, well, we need to find a way to improve our, our uh, maybe our economic situation or our living situation uh, through sports, put it that way. And there is a tremendous level of hunger that's involved uh, in that. And so I can see him, I can see why he uh, made that move. And I think that's where you broke off with the reading. And so in the meantime, I would break off with my talking and uh, allow someone else to speak. Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, greetings, Gus, uh, to the other callers. I hope uh, everyone is as well as can be expected in the system of white supremacy. I'll begin my comments, commentary uh, where Mr. Oliver was 
discussing the uh, UCLA boys on page 167 where he expressed some disappointment that the uh, black boy did not come back to see him. I guess uh, that was a white boy and a black boy that he was giving instructions to. And he expressed uh, uh, you know, some sadness that the black boy didn't show any appreciation. But I'd just like to say that uh, <clears throat> the genuine appreciation, you know, a lot of times it may be felt but not expressed. And that in a system of white supremacy, non-white black people, its maturity has been retorted. And to expect a proper response may or may not be expected too much. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Mr. Williams can probably appreciate that because whether or not his daughters at this time you know, show genuine uh, appreciation for what he did and all the hard work that went into him helping them develop their expertise. I'm sure that he knows that they are appreciative of what had happened. Um, there was a part where he said that uh, I guess People's just people. And, you know, I don't uh, know what he meant by that, but it seemed to, that whole little segment right there seemed to uh, reek with a ghostwriter. It seems to be putting down the, the black boy because uh, we don't know whether he was appreciative or not. It's it just because he didn't express it. In uh, Linwood Park uh, was where a lot of the different black players were gathering to uh, play tennis or to uh, high side or whatever you might call it. It seems as though they were into fashions and hairstyles and and fancy cars and more looking the part rather than actually playing tennis. And Miss Williams called them uh, pretentious assholes. Got into a little name calling there, but um, Mr. Williams was. Uh, Palimonious to say, the, to put it mildly, where he owned his own business by now, but he uh, didn't even have a reliable car. The uh, uh, it was smoking, making a lot of noise, and the, the lining was falling out of the top of it. I took note on the uh, the negative feedback that Mr. Williams was getting every time that he would mention that he's going to raise two daughters and they're going to be tennis champions. It seems as it's easier to poison someone's wealth or to put another black person down rather than to encourage or to support. I also made note of Omar who was an interesting character. He was uh, a Vietnam veteran. Uh, he seemed to be conscious, well-educated, had a lot of books, and uh, concerning Africa and black consciousness, he, he sounded like a pan-African, pan, uh, well, a nationalist, but a pan-African nationalist, I guess. But it threw me off when he was 
uh, making extra money, lecturing uh, white people, lecturing the white students in those uh, student meetings. And it, he said that the black man used to own his own stores, but now every other nationality is moving in and taking our money. And he asked the question if we were, if we were blind or if we just playing crazy. I wonder how much money Omar would have made if he had been lecturing the white people and letting them know that they were the problem and that all of the blame that the black people were experiencing those the oppression that black people were experiencing was a result of mistreatment by white people. Wonder how much money, extra money he would have made if he brought that to their attention. And I'm beginning to wonder if Mr. Williams didn't choose uh, I'm gonna wonder if I'm saying her name correctly or seen uh, for the sole purpose of her genetic qualities to help produce these champions that he had in mind. And then I'll finish up with, it seems that Venus and Serena was born right at the time when the government, with the help of the CIA, the DEA, the DIA, the FBI, all were aiding in drug trafficking and sending it through those arms in Contra right through South Central Los Angeles. And <clears throat> to uh, just borrow a phrase from the uh, foreword of Dark Alliance by Gary Webb, the Congresswoman Maxine Waters wrote, that uh, she suspected that these agencies knew about that drug trafficking all the time and actually aided in it. And on page 193, uh, he made a statement about uh, in the depths of my heart. Uh, in the depths of my heart, I wish God would rain down brimstone and fire and totally consume every gang member and cast him into the pits of hell. Maybe the police can line them up and sentence them to death by firing squad. Kill all the bastards. And then he asked the question, was I insane? Were these the thoughts of a rational man? How could a man of kindness and humility change so quickly? I think that, you know, if he had been able to see the big picture, how the government was uh, bringing those drugs in and creating havoc in the black community, he may not have been so hard on the black people in his community. So uh, I'll just mute my line. Thanks for taking the call. Appreciate that. Um, I think Mr. Williams does comment that uh, he had concluded that the police in the L.A. area were not much help in dealing with the gangs because uh, it seemed like there was quite a bit of uh, corruption and perhaps even cooperation with the black gang members uh, I think he includes that in the text as well so even I think he and Maxine Waters might have been uh, at least had some level of agreement with regards to what was happening uh, during this time period um, caller at 0230 are you with us as well Perseverance I think or is this shy I'm getting confused with our New York callers yes this is Perseverance right on good evening everybody um 
this is a great show, great book, um, and Mr. Williams has a lot of good counter-racist strategies for us. Um, one thing that I like about Mr. Williams is that he's a long-term planner. Um, his planning, um, his planned child-rearing strategies um, definitely worked out for his two daughters. Um, and, I, and I remember Dr. Welsing saying something that she says people should not have kids until they're in their 30s. And I kind of agree, agree with this because, you know, he's able to plan for them. You know, he's able to plan financially for them, think about their futures, um, kind of work out where they might have some obstacles, and, you know, he's able to be there as a parent. Um, words that I have for Mr. Williams would be meticulous, calculating, logical, observant, um, and thinking outside of the box. And I just see this over and over um, as we're reading this book. Also, I, I know in previous shows we talked about his um, being frugal and, you know, he's saying that he was saving money to build wealth. And I know that we kind of look down on that, but what I kind of see now is he was actually being frugal so that he could invest in the future. So, you know, him buying these tennis balls for real cheap, you know, pinching here, pinching there. I think he was just really trying to set aside a nest egg to really invest in these girls when the, when the time came around. He could really invest in you know, what they needed to become, you know, these great tennis players. So I kind of see that. And I see, you know, he says at one point, you know, people had jerry curls and, you know, all these fancy clothes. And I think that's one way that racism get us. Um, they get us to, to purchase these, you know, things to look fancy and to look nice. And if we took all of this money that we purchased on, on sneakers or Nikes and all this other stuff and put it towards logical business, you know, businesses with business plans um, and, you know, and, and market businesses in the black community, we would be um, much further ahead. So this is kind of how I see that, that frugal. I think it pays off in the long run. Um, but that's all I have to say, so I'm going to mute my line. <laughs> right on, right on. Uh, any of the fo other folks that are listening in, if you all have comments, you want to get in on the first segment, uh, we have uh, a little less than 30 minutes before we get to the next audio segment, still in uh, Chapter 18 when we resume. Uh, quick thoughts uh, that I had. Um, number one, I think <clears throat> the exchange that we started off with is kind of the tail end of uh, Chapter 15 when he's getting tennis lessons from Old Whiskey. Uh, we were talking last week about... Uh, even though Mr. Williams said that he didn't drink, I think he said he had something like three drinks or something really low throughout his life. Uh, but him seeming to not have a problem uh, having contact with other black people who do drink or maybe even alcoholics. Um, I thought it was a really great counter counter racist illustration. He said that he disagreed with almost everything that old whiskey taught. But he still appreciated what he had to offer. And I think that's something that we can definitely utilize with other black people. Um, you know, it's not saying that you have to agree with the, every viewpoint that that particular black person has about counter racism or whatever else uh, it happens to be on. Use what you can. Surely uh, they have to have some expertise or some information that you don't that would be a benefit to you. Use what you can and try your best not to make it that just becomes a point of contention where you can just sit around and argue uh, at least from the book it didn't sound like he just spent all of his time uh griping and arguing with old whiskey and talking about how he was stupid and this is why people don't come back and talk to you this is why the black people the black guy didn't uh come back after his success and what have you at ucla this is why he didn't come back and talk to you because your your techniques are old and stupid and you're drunk it didn't seem like he had that uh perspective uh that viewpoint of old whiskey it seemed like he was appreciative uh, for what he taught and you know um even included him in the book um i also i thought it was interesting because i think we got a lot of 
Bible <laughs> referencing uh, this week. There's more to come uh, in the next portion, but I think we got a lot of that this week. I know that uh, came up last week uh, in the text, and uh, it almost seemed like Old Testament, like fire and brimstone and drown the whole planet out when he's uh, voicing his frustrations uh, with the uh, gang activity, black gang activity in L.A. And I guess one thought that I would get in, I mentioned uh, Yatunde Price uh, last week, and I don't I haven't read this book before, so I don't know uh, if that's coming up. I would kind of be stunned. I, that's when I might I, Dr. Rossellon again. I think I'd put a hundred to a donut that that's got to come up in the book. Uh, I don't know how he would do that without including what happens to her. But uh, I, I my suspicion is I don't know how you could lose a child to gang activity and not have a lot of anger and frustration uh, about gang members, gang activity, notwithstanding everything that he went through personally, uh, being abused and trying to access the tennis courts and that sort of thing and having people selling drugs in front of his uh, property. And he talking about even his security business, how they would have to jump in sheds and what have you to protect themselves. Uh, and, and even if I guess we go back to last week when they were robbing the, uh, the gas station and kind of put his, put himself at risk there as well. Um, but definitely, uh, losing a child to gang activity when your child was not a gang member, was not involved in that at all. Uh, and ended up being killed that, I mean, I, I can't even begin to fathom how that would, uh, impact, um, my perspective and the way that I talked about uh, black gang members. So I just I think that's important. And uh, that's something that I'll be kind of looking out for when that does come up uh, later on in the text. Um, this the whole notion of black people being super strong in the ghetto. Uh, like I feel like or it's not I feel uh, I have heard many different manifestations of that down through the years. Uh, Dr. Angelo even talked about that, this this mythology, I would call it, of the, the super black person, particularly super black females and indestructible. And, you know, we're, we're just so powerful because of all that we've gone through. I even hear people, they, they reference it all the way back to slavery and say that we are so strong and so tough uh, as a people because of, of what we have gone through. And I just, uh, I, I wouldn't say cringe, uh, but I definitely am, am not sold uh, on that notion. Um, when I view us collectively, uh, we are in real tough shape. And you could just Ferguson. You don't need to go all the way around Ezel Ford if we want to make it uh, current or, or relating geography uh, geographically to where we are in the text right now. But uh, I just do not see uh, people that are, I mean, I, I guess it would come down to what do you mean by tough? What do you mean by strong? Uh, I mean, if you, I think when Mr. Fuller talks about this, he says, if you're saying able to, to take punishment, maybe, but I mean, if we're, if we're talking about success and being able to dominate uh, in specific areas of people activity, being able to dominate as you move about this planet. I do not see that from the black collective. And I definitely would not say that, hey, going to the ghetto, that's how you're going to dominate Wall Street. I mean, it's it's almost like I, I can't even imagine anybody saying that in any other capacity except athletics. Like I could not imagine somebody saying uh, you want to dominate Wall Street. You want to move to the ghetto and raise your child there. That's how you're going to take over Wall Street. Or you want to have the next generation of Johnny Cochran, man, uh, for folks Chicago, because he was there when Cabrini Green was there. Like, yeah, go to Cabrini Greens. That's how you will take over uh, and be a legal tycoon. Uh, you want to get to the Supreme Court, uh, go to the worst. I mean, that just is absurd. Um, I just, all of that, I, I just, I have a uh, real, I'm not sold on that one. That's what I'm not willing to pick up. Cause I hear that it's almost cliche to me, uh, when I hear people, uh, talking that matter. Now, again, he certainly, the proof is in the pudding. His daughters are, are doing what they do. Uh, but I would just, your tune day price, I would just put it there and, and we can maybe reevaluate that as we move through the book. Um, did folks have thoughts uh, I guess two major aspects. Number one, going back to where we kind of ended at last week, people saying that they thought maybe Bart Davis, the ghostwriter, racist suspect, uh, that he might be forcing some of this 
uh, Christian uh, religious commentary into the book. There seems to be, uh, it seems like there's a lot of it this week, especially the way he was talking about the gang members, even his conversation that he had with uh, Old Whiskey. There's been quite a bit of it before, but it seemed like there was particularly a lot of it this week. Uh, do folks think that this is is genuine? Do we think that this is really representative of, of Mr. Williams, uh, what he thinks, the way that he raised his daughters, the way that he was raised by his uh, mother? Or do we think that this is uh, the fingerprint of the ghostwriter? And then I also uh, wanted to ask about this decision to move where his wife, Oracine, uh she does not want to go (laughs) saying this is dangerous. This is crazy. This is a huge drop off in our quality of life. And I think he even said everybody uh, who was old enough to have an accurate understanding of what was happening around them. All of them did not want to go. He's the only one that's saying, let's do this. What do what what are people's uh, thoughts on this effort to uh, relocate to this area to save money and train and for all of the uh, I'm having to keep from laughing. All of the benefits uh, of living on Curtis Mayfield's other side of town. Those would be uh, two questions for any of the folks that are listening in. Uh, I would say, uh, in uh, my reference to uh, to uh, the the hunger that exists. And I think I heard you say it, it, it's only limited to uh, sports and individuals who participate in sports. Uh, that I have observed over the years from being a coach for a long time. Uh, and that's it. Uh, other than that, you, you're absolutely correct. Uh, it, it would be like a cringe type of uh Look on my behalf if if, if someone is is uh, attempting to think something different that exists in this war and the the most dilapidated war zone being in the non-white black areas where we're allowed to stay uh, is uh, devastation. Uh, your 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 recent question was what. Uh, that was that was one. And then the other one was uh, about uh, the in the book, all of these uh, references to the Bible and Jesus and and the the biblical way, even that he's talking about the gang situation. Uh, do we think that is an authentic representation of Mr. Williams or do we think that that is the influence of the ghostwriter, Bart Davis? Mm. Hmm. Uh. I would say uh, it would probably be Ghost Rider, especially if there's a white person involved. They would uh, put their uh, fingerprint, so to speak, on on a book and the stereotypical uh, uh, identifications with with non-white black people with the with that with that. Uh, fantasy book that they wrote called the Bible. Actually, not fantasy book, but that terrible book that they called the Bible. Uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would point towards, uh, the, as Mr. Fuller said, the usual suspect, especially if a, a ghostwriter was a white person. May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Um, Mr. Williams clearly stated earlier in the book that he rejected, um, he didn't say it, I'm rephrasing it, that he rejected um, the white God concept, and I do think it is the ghost writer. Um, You know, whoever is publishing the book, they still have to make a certain amount of money, so I think that the ghost writer did inject a few of these words, um, you know, similar to what happened with um, the warmth of other, other sons. Um, but um, us counter racist people, I think we can kind of read between the lines. I, I can at least. And as far as you know, moving the children or moving to Compton, moving to the hood, I think what Mr. Williams is trying to do is um, trying to subject the kids to. 
um, or or have a, have a higher threshold to pain um, or higher threshold to racism and you know things that are going to try them later on in life. So it's kind of like a vaccine effect to racism or or pressures of racism in the future. You know, let's let's move to Compton so you know how to deal with this stuff. And when you grow up, it's not going to um, deter you off course. So that's what I kind of get out of it. I'm going to mute my line. Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Okay, when it comes to the move to Compton, uh, based, I had an uncle who spent 30 to 40 years living in Compton. He retired uh, working in the shipyards, but one of the first things he did was get out of there. So he didn't really have a lot of nice things to say about Compton. So uh, I would question, you know, that that move to Compton based upon, you know, what my uncle would say about it and how he despised living there. Well, he stayed for 30, 40 years, but first chance he got, he... He got out of there. It was pretty bad. Uh, and then as far as the Ghost Rider, uh, um, I know that he's influencing a lot of this, and, you know, about the uh, religious aspect of everything because uh, it just seems to contradict, you know, in the, in, on the same page, some of the things that he's saying. And then the way that it's expressed later on. I think that the ghostwriter has quite a bit to do with the uh, religious part. Now I'll mute my line. Did we miss anybody? Any uh, folks have a hand up who uh, wanted to comment, hadn't, hadn't chimed in yet? Not sure, folks. May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Uh, greetings, everyone. Um, I think I feel a little bit differently than, you know, the majority of the listeners in that, um, you know, I've been through not anywhere near what uh, Mr. Williams has been through, but some tragedy in, in my life. And... Um, what it did was it, it made me see things a lot differently. And from what Mr. Williams said, you can tell he's a very spiritual person. He, you know, even when you go back to when he was in Chicago and got really angry and, you know, went as far as to just go after that police officer. You know, he has um, very strong values, even though he was into revenge for a while. He um, still um, just kind of kept pushing forward. With all the things that happened to him, without faith, he would have, you know. Uh -oh. I'm not sure. Uh... Oh. Whoa. So I think that very life given that all the things that Mr. went through was able to persevere You're, and there's a ring ringing on is that on your line? It's like somebody's pressing a phone button or something. Is that you or is, I, I'm sorry. There was, it was just, uh, it was like somebody was pressing buttons on the phone. Uh, I wasn't sure if it was coming from your line or another line, but are, are you able to hear that or are you not hearing that? Yeah, but, but, um, actually, I I heard heard you. The, um, to the Bluetooth, so maybe, do you still hear it? Uh, I don't hear it now, no ma'am. Oh, okay, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> what I was trying to say is that I, I do think that it's consistent with 
the things that uh, Mr. Williams has said and said and done that you know is, is de definitely a display of his faith. And I kind of I, I haven't actually met any white people, even those that claim to be Christian, that would be able to to connect things the way those scriptures were connected to you know the ones where his where he's been. And, um, where, you know, he's seeking guidance, how to cry out to God. I've not met any that um, can actually, that actually have that understanding. They have a very superficial knowledge. As you say, um, they believe in a white Jesus. They don't really believe in Jesus. And so I, I kind of uh, would disagree and believe that those are consistent with Mr. Williams. And I will mute my line. That is, uh, that is interesting. Um, at least for the moment, and this is one I suspect this is going to come up repeatedly. Make sure I get in as well before I forget uh, the whole uh, <laughs> fashion show that was on display uh, when he was at the Linwood Tennis Courts. Uh, that is right out of Warmth of Other Suns, since that book did get uh, referenced, the lovely Isabel Wilkerson, uh, where she has quite a few passages talking about black people uh, and being so much at, uh, Dr. Robert Pershing Foster, <laughs> who was all about fashion and, and showing out. We, we even had uh, one of our listeners, he tweeted last week when Mr. Williams was talking about when he first got to California and he was buying property and, and buying a house. And he was saying that when he compared the value of his house to the value of the white people's houses, it was no contest. Uh, and he said that he knew a doctor who had, I guess, his property overlooked Encino and it was worth a lot more money. He was uh, questioning whether or not that was uh, Dr. Robert uh, Pershing Foster, um, who also moved to California. I'm not sure. Um, he was also in Southern California. Could be. Um, I almost feel like that's something doctor, if I, if memory serves, Dr. Foster seemed like a name dropper. <laughs> like, uh, I think if he, if he had known Richard Williams, uh, by the time that book came out, uh, warmth of other sons, 2010, he's a big star. His daughters are big stars. Uh, he strikes me as the type of person who would have probably found a way to mention that, uh, when he's talking about his life, he said he loved to talk about himself, but, uh, I don't know. That's one to, to kind of uh, folks can dig research and, and see if that's true. But I did think that was a good catch from a listener uh, with that suspicion. Anywho, uh, getting back to the Christian can element ghostwriter or no, uh, it certainly could be both. Uh, but at least for right now, uh, I'm actually leaning more in line with the perspective of the, the previous female caller. Um, I think the, the Christian references that might be uh, or biblical references, I think that might be authentic. Um, I would go again, uh, it's public record, uh, Venus and Serena are Jehovah witnesses. Um, mm -hmm. that seems to be, you know, that's not disputed. Uh, they've, I've heard them say that in interviews, it's online. That's a matter of public record. So as I said last week, it seems like there was some religious system in the household, uh, that they were growing up with. Uh, and just with the spirituality, I think as the callers were saying, and I think it came out last week, it's going to continue to come out this week. Um, it seems like there's a strong spiritual drive in all of this. I think when his mom, even though he did say earlier in the book that he rejected all that white Jesus stuff, the way that white people are behaving and we're just going to give it all to God. But when his mom tells him that she thinks God has something important for him to do, it didn't seem like he rejected that as hogwash. It seemed like, you know, he was on board with that. Like, yeah, I am supposed to do something. I don't know what that is, but I am supposed to do something. And, I would even say one that seems kind of right out in front uh, to name your daughter's Venus. That seems kind of spiritual to me um, in terms of your thinking, uh, particularly this is a daughter that is supposed to be the most dominant tennis player ever. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm purposely conceiving these children to go out and dominate white tennis. And I'm going to name her Venus Maybe that's not white Jesus Christianity, but that certainly strikes me as a, a very spiritual naming. I think it's Venus Ebony uh, when he gave the full name this week. That's uh, wow. I mean, black love. Is that almost what we're, we're getting at? That, that just that's incredible. I think there's a strong spiritual element. Uh, I, I might be in line with the last caller. Uh, and there's a lot of it. I mean, that 
I, I would almost have to be saying, OK, do I think the ghostwriter, Bart Davis, is able to make up this much stuff that keeps coming up in the book? And Mr. Williams, he didn't read this like he didn't check it over, like to let all this go as as something that is not authentically representing his perspective, what he thought, what happened uh, in his lives. If we think he's this strong of a person and standing up for himself, standing up for for other black people, that he would let all of that go. Like, uh, I don't know, I'm, at least for right now, that's something I definitely think we should keep open kind of uh, watch out for for the rest of the book. It's going to continue to come up. But uh, I, I might at least for right now, I'm more in agreement with uh the last caller's perspective, I could be, uh, could be an error. We have about five, maybe six minutes left before we get to the second audio clip. Anything else folks wanted to, uh, get in on anything that we've touched on so far this week? I'd like to mention the part where he said he he decided to get out of the killing fields where blacks had no respect for their own humanity. I just, uh, I don't know. Uh, it seems as though he had a lot of tolerance for uh, people before with addiction when it was to alcohol. But now... Uh, the drug situation, you know, it's a, it's a different form of addiction. And the selling of crack would be directly related to the poverty and the lack of uh, employment. I just, like you said, maybe uh, because of the fact that one of his daughters was killed by gang members, you know, it would create that venomous type attitude that he had. But I just, it seems like uh, he had absolutely no use for any of those people. <clears throat> uh, uh, to revisit the, uh, the uh, strategy to uh, uh, be around non-white black people in concentrated areas with the idea of mind of something <laughs> of that along the lines of hunger to achieve in sports. Uh, I've I've all I've experienced this myself, uh, even with a uh, white mother sending her white son into a uh, all-black environment for that purpose, uh, only for that purpose, actually. Uh, high school level, uh, the team itself went all the way to the uh, Florida State tit uh, title in football finals. Uh, they lost, and ultimately the Florida High School Athletic Association caught up with it and they uh, forfeited all of that team's uh, wins uh, because of that particular uh, uh, transfer. Uh, it happens uh, even from the idea as if you if you study uh, boxing gyms, they are in the most uh, some of the most run down areas. Some of the, the world champions. Uh, 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 used to work out at certain places uh, of that nature, uh, especially in this part of the world. I would I would also would uh, say in a in a lot of other parts of the world where there are non-white people at uh, the most raunchiest areas uh, uh, where they have boxing gyms that uh, some of the great fighters train in those places with that idea in mind. But like I said, it. It primarily is that idea is probably is primarily limited with sports and on the and on and, and within the people the people activity of entertainment slash sports only from the standpoint of the participant not not the owners not agents <laughs> anything like the people who control the sports or control the athletes 
primarily just the athletic standpoint where that is uh, sometimes encouraged. Uh, for some reason, I would say maybe 30, 40 years ago, uh, uh, that was in, that was basically uh, is in, it was encouraged to get into sports to quote unquote get out of the area, and that's where this hunger drive uh, emerged. At one time, when I was a teenager, uh, there was an effort to use sports in order to finance your college career. In my in, in, which, in my mind, is much more work of a constructive. Uh, uh, endeavor as opposed to play sports just to become a professional. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but as I mentioned before, it is only limited to uh, uh, from the standpoint of uh, this idea about coming into and proximity into areas where non white people are allowed to stay. Uh, it's primarily from the standpoint to this hunger. Uh, urge to succeed, rub off. It's only limited to sports. As far as playing is concerned. Mm. Right on. Uh, folks can keep that in mind as we uh, continue to journey through the book. Um, this <laughs> this move here and how folks are, are feeling about this as we proceed through the books. I I would even say that that. Uh, <laughs> This notion of uh, these super athletes it almost sounds Jimmy the Greekish kind of, um, but these super athletes uh, in the ghetto, uh, that's that's kind of uh, the story for Rocky Three, where he's lost his edge and they're going to take him back. and He'll get it back by going and training in some dilapidated gym uh, with a bunch of black people. Uh, and that's how he'll, he'll get his edge back. I mean, it's. I don't know, man. Kobe Bryant played in Italy, and he's easily regarded as one of the greatest basketball players of all time. He was not in Compton, Chile. <laughs> he was in. He wasn't even in this part of the world, and he seems to be doing great. Uh, and it's even been my observation: a lot of, uh, particularly with basketball and some of the other sports, these folks, uh, it's the exact opposite. You get whisked away to go to some private Catholic academy uh, or some other. A uh, place where you're going to be living and you're away from everybody. Uh, your family are totally removed uh, from other black people unless they too are there to play sports. Uh, that's what's going to father. Uh, that's what's going to advance your career. That's LeBron James. That's Kevin Garnett. That's Kevin Durant. That's you know you can go on down the line uh, for basketball players. It seems to be the exact opposite. So. Uh, I don't know. That's just one we can ponder on as we roll. Uh, we will get to the second audio clip. Um, we are at the very early stages of chapter 18, very, very beginning, uh, where we'll be picking up at. Can't give the page number, but shouldn't be too tough to find. Uh, if you had thoughts you wanted to get in uh, that you were not able to share, just jot them down. We should have ample time for folks to share once the second audio segment concludes. Keep an eye out. Uh, Christianity or spirituality is going to continue to be a major theme uh, for the rest of chapter eight, uh, 18. Excuse me. Context of white supremacy, Mr. Richard Williams, black and white, the way I see it. Every day I left home, I didn't know if I would return. I kissed my wife and children as if each day was my last. I didn't know where to start, but I knew City Hall was not going to help me. No one was on my side. After considering all my options and facing the fact there were none, I realized I had to free up the tennis courts in the local park so I could proceed with my plan to train my daughters to be the greatest tennis players who ever lived. I went to Paramount Sports, owned by Ted and Bill Hodges, where I always bought used balls and bought 300 more for $30. I wanted to use old balls to train the girls, ones without much bounce, so they would have to build up the speed to get to anything. They didn't know a new ball from an old ball, so it wouldn't bother them. They'd have to generate their own power and run even harder, just like I did when I was fleeing white people in the South. I always bought 29 
Cobra rackets made by Wilson and some big Prince rackets. I added some rackets from a company called Yonix to my supply. When certain models were discontinued, the store drilled holes in them so they would break if you hit a ball. For almost nothing, I bought a bunch to use for swinging practice. I now had almost all the parts of the plane. I had studied tennis and mastered the game. My daughters were strong and healthy and ready to be trained. I had the environment to make the girls tough. I had the equipment and the training plan that I was now putting into effect. Only one more thing remained, a place to play. I needed tennis courts I could use whenever I wanted for as long as I wanted and I wanted them to be free. There was a gentleman named James Powers who taught at Inglewood High School in Inglewood, California. I knew him from when I was learning to play. His sister worked at the park in Compton where there were abandoned tennis courts. They had broken glass all over them. They were dirty. There was human waste on them along with needles, condoms, and anything else you could think of that was filthy or contaminated. They were exactly what I needed. I asked James's sister if I could clean them up and use them. She said, if you can get on the courts, you can use them as much as you want. I immediately got a broom to sweep them and used a hose to wash them. But hygiene was not my biggest problem. My problem was the gang members. This was their area to sell drugs and the territory all around the tennis courts was theirs. Perhaps naively, after I cleaned the courts, I asked them to move elsewhere so we could use them. No, man, we ain't moving. They told me flatly. The more I talked to them, the more they insisted they weren't going anywhere. I said, well, someone is going to have to take the tennis courts from you then. It won't do no good to call the police, they told me, smiling. In this, they were right. Calling the police was useless. The relationship between the gangs and the police was one of indifference, corruption, and crime. Most cops' attitude was, let the niggers take care of themselves. I believed they were paid off from drug profits, so there was no profit in interfering. Gang members had Tech Nines and other automatic weapons. They didn't mind shooting you either. Unlike the cops, they had no paperwork to fill out or citizen review boards to worry about. In the process of trying to get the gang members to move on, I got my teeth knocked out, my nose broken, my jaw broken, and my fingers dislocated. I took a beating almost every day. They beat me so badly I could barely walk. But I kept on coming back until they finally started saying, Old man, do anything hurt you? I said, yeah. I hurt, but damn if I'm going. You better go, they warned me. I said, I'll be back tomorrow. And every day, I'd go back. A year later, I had not gained any ground. The gangs were still in charge of the parks, still selling drugs. My activity was stressing out my family. The children were constantly asking, why do you hang in the streets so much, Daddy? Why do you take a stick with a piece of pipe on the tip everywhere you go? Why do you come home with blood on your clothes? Why is your head always wrapped in white bandages? Why do you wear shades in the house? My explanations always upset them, especially Orsine. She was totally against my risking my life in Compton. Richard, what about your family? 
What are we going to do if something happens to you while you're out there fighting with gangs? You're too old for that. If they won't let you use the courts, go somewhere else. Let's move out of this crazy place. My response was simple. Nothing can hurt me because God is on my side. Disgusted, she said, let's see if God is on your side when they're kicking in your ribs. Trying to teach tennis and help the people in the community was a full-time job, but I had to find a way to do it. As always, my security company was a perfect business for me. I could provide a valuable service, make money, and create my own schedule to work with Venus and Serena. My security firm had a contract with a check cashing business and the owner paid me to provide security. Security meant something quite different in Compton than most places. Sometimes while checking on my men guarding the building, we'd have to jump into an old steel shed where they kept pipes and construction materials because gang members doing target practice shot their automatic weapons and bullets came flying by. One evening at work, I realized I had forgotten to go to the pharmacy to pick up some medication. Just after dark, I saw an old black man walking down my side of the street. He was probably in his late 60s. He looked honest and was decently dressed, and I thought he might help me. I stepped out from the building and said, Excuse me, sir. As soon as I spoke, He crossed over to the other side of the road. I caught up to him and said, Why are you dodging me? I never did anything to you. He said, Son, where I come from in Alabama, you see a black man, you get yourself happy. Now, when I see one, it scares the living shit out of me and you black. I felt bad. I said, I understand what you're going through, but I'm not that way. He shook his head sadly. Well, I won't take the chance. That's how frightened he was. That was the climate of fear. What made it worse was we were all black. We were doing it to each other in the same race within the same community. Hurt and violence was not an outside threat anymore. It was us. It was the only time I was ever ashamed to be black. It was a dark time for sure. Why was it so hard to live among my own people? One night when I was checking my security guards, I saw a building on fire on Wilmington near Compton Boulevard. I ran up and saw the owner just watching it burn. Like a fool, I started to run to call the police and fire department. He said, Hey, wait, whatever you do, don't stop it. Don't stop it, I repeated, shocked. He shook his head. If you do, I lose money. It took me a moment to realize he was letting it burn for the insurance money. That was Compton. Yet, the truth was that a spark of ambition also lay under the surface, dying to get out. It was part of why I stayed. I knew two young men who were coming up strong. They vowed they would someday gain world attention. One was a boy called Easy E. The other was called Snoop Dogg. They sold their records from the thrifty drugstore and out of the backs of their cars to the neighborhood people. It made me see that no matter how much I thought I was the only one trying to do something in the neighborhood, other people were too. There were young people with aspirations, wishing to break free and refusing not to try. I spent a lot of time building relationships with the gang members, learning to talk to them and listening to them. In some ways, I was a bit of a father figure. Most had never known one. 
Many of them reminded me of the time when I was much younger and just living to die. Caring about nothing convinced the future held nothing but my doom. Their eyes were dead without hope. Yet, as different as we were, a fragile trust began to grow. It made things a bit easier, but never easy. It was commonplace for me to get to know a young man only to have him disappear soon after and be told when I asked where he was that he was dead. I wanted to start working with Venus on the Compton tennis courts when she was five years old, but I realized the park was still too dangerous. I had to find a way to persuade the gang members to release their hold on it. It was an impossible task, but one I had to accomplish. I went to the park every day. Drug transactions were continuous. Buyers came on bikes, motorcycles, and cars, and on foot from the best neighborhoods to the worst. There was a drug empire operating in the heart of Compton, and the park was its main headquarters, their main street. Asking the gang to give up part of the park was asking for a death sentence. After many months of ineffective negotiating and getting into arguments and fights, I decided to take Venus to the courts anyway. She was past five and already way behind in her training. Going to the courts was a risk I had to be willing to take. Feeling a little apprehensive, I took my broomstick with me just in case. It was three feet long with a four inch piece of steel pipe stuck on the end. Cracking one of those gangbangers across the head was not a problem for me if it protected us. Venus and I walked through the park holding hands and singing. She was aware of the gang activity in the park because drugs were sold everywhere in the neighborhood, including right in front of our house. While I was showing Venus how to swing her racket, two rival gang members got into a fight outside the court. One of them pulled a knife, stabbed the other one, and then started kicking him. Everyone else retreated. It was obvious no one was going to stop them. I tried to ignore it and keep pitching balls over the net to Venus. Suddenly, she motioned me close. Daddy, why are those men cutting each other up? She asked innocently. Is this where you get cut up? Venus, I'll explain that to you when we get home. Stay here on the court. I'll be right back. With a quizzical look in her eyes, Venus held her racket against her chest and stood by the fence. I grabbed my broomstick and walked over to the fight. For a moment, I hesitated. I looked back at Venus. I kept telling myself, she will be okay. My life had turned into a game of Russian roulette, and it was only a matter of time before the hammer struck the wrong chamber. The fight was none of my business, but I felt a need to stop it, to get involved. People had crowded all around them, but no one dared say a word or intervene. It was important to set an example. Black people could help black people not just hurt them. As I went to break it up, a flashback exploded in my mind. Back in Shreveport, I had been stabbed trying to break up a fight just like this. Since then, I learned never to step between two people fighting. It always left your back exposed and made you an easy target. The gang member was still kicking his fallen enemy. Making my way through the crowd, I appealed to his better nature. Come on, young man. You can't keep kicking a man when he's down. He's had enough. Yeah, whatever, old man. Next time, I'm going to stomp that nigger's brains out. 
he looked at the kid on the ground. Let that be a lesson to you. Don't fuck with me. He kicked him again and walked away, laughing and joking with his homeboys. I said, somebody go call the police. The young man was bleeding from his chest. The left side of his face was swollen and blood spilled from the side of his head. Three of his teeth were on the ground, coated in blood. He moaned. Thank you. I went back on the court and hit balls to Venus. I waited for the sound of the ambulance, but it never came. Fifteen minutes later, I looked over to where I left the kid. He was gone. No ambulance, no police, and no police report. This would be settled on the streets. Venus and I stayed on the court for an hour. After practice, we picked up the balls, the rackets, and my broomstick. We walked hand in hand through the park. When we approached where the fight had taken place, she said, Oh, Daddy, you're so brave. The other people were scared, but not my daddy. I'm going to be just like you when I grow up. I asked, What do you mean by that, Venus? She answered, I'm going to be the champion of tennis and queen of the court. No one will ever be able to beat me just like they can't beat you. I laughed aloud, lightly squeezed Venus's hand and walked home. Maybe all those cuts and bruises I carried were worth it. Two weeks later, I was on the court with Venus and saw three gang members take an old man's walker from him just outside the gate. He just stood there. He couldn't move without his walker. It brought tears of rage to my eyes. Finally, helpless, the old man fell to the ground and the gang members just left him there. I told Venus sternly, sit down until I come back. I ran up to the gang members to ask them to give the walker back or give it to me and I would give it back. Why did you take his walker? I asked. One answered, I was going to rob him, but he didn't have any money, man. I can sell this for a few dollars and get me some stuff. I said, give that man his walker back. He said, nigger, I'll give you my foot in your ass. So I said, tell you what, I give you my foot first. And I went to take the walker from him and the two other kids. The three of them jumped me. They shoved me. They punched me. I lost my balance, fell to the ground, and they started kicking me. I could hear Venus's small voice in the background yelling, don't hit my daddy. After it was over, I picked myself up and headed for Venus. Why had I tried to stop them? The same reason I had for staying in Compton, an old man on a walker who couldn't do anything but stand there when gang members took it. I helped the old man to his feet. Then I got Venus collected our gear, and walked the old man to our Volkswagen bus. I said, Sir, I'll have another walker for you before the day is over. Hopelessness is a heavy weight on your shoulders, sometimes too heavy to carry. I saw it in the old man's eyes. I felt it inside me. I wanted it away from Venus worried it could infect her like a disease. I was humiliated. No father wants his child to see him beat up. But Venus saw things her way. She said, Daddy, you can really fight. I want a heart like yours. I want to be just like you, Daddy. I neglected to mention that winning might be the better goal for her and just shook my head. Venus, I don't ever want to see you fighting like I was doing. 
I don't ever want you around dangerous criminals. I just want you to work on your tennis and get the best education that's possible. She looked at me with a devilish grin and said, I want to get me some boxing gloves so I can learn how to fight just like you. I took the old man home and then we went home. I told Oracine what happened and that I intended to replace the walker. She wasn't happy, but when I made my mind up about something, there was no stopping me. I went door to door through the neighborhood collecting money. People in the neighborhood were very understanding, and after a few hours, I had enough for a new one. I put the money in an envelope, drove to the old man's house, and slid the envelope under the door. The training continued. Every day, I took Venus to the court to work out. Serena always wanted to go along because she and Venus were so close, a bond that would last a lifetime. I was afraid to bring them at first, but soon began a routine of taking both girls to the court. For a while, things were okay, but it was just a matter of time before a confrontation took place. In December of 1985, alone, I got the worst Christmas gift I ever received. In my continuing effort to get the gangs to stay away from the courts, I got into a fight with six or seven gang members. To this day, the details are hazy, but I do remember when I woke up that ten of my teeth were missing from being kicked in the mouth. Over the years, I have grown accustomed to not having teeth, and to this day, where my toothlessness as a badge of courage. On top of that, however, I had a sprained arm and broken ribs. Breathing caused me excruciating pain. I had to go to the hospital to be treated. It was embarrassing. Black eyes, broken ribs, missing teeth, and swollen jaw. To make matters worse, the tires on my Volkswagen bus were slashed and the windshield smashed. How could I go home this way? I looked around. My tennis balls were scattered everywhere and my rackets were cracked. I was lost. My dreams were smashed like my body. How could I face my family? I thought things over. It took a while for me to see the bright side of things, but I decided I came out ahead. I was alive. However, I wasn't able to go to the tennis court for weeks. Days seemed like months as they dragged by. Anxiety consumed me. Every night, I would lie awake in bed thinking about all the money I had to spend to fix my bus and replace the balls and rackets. I stayed awake plotting my revenge. The day would come when I would return to the courts. Finally, I was able to go back, but this time I didn't take Venus and Serena. Instead, I took my 12-gauge pump shotgun. Nothing's as scary as the click-chunk sound of that pump driving a shell into the breach. I drove up to the court and saw some of the gang members that had beat me up selling drugs. They had stomped the teeth out of my mouth. They had kicked me in the head and broken my ribs without hesitation or remorse. Enough was enough. I couldn't take any more. Not one more day. It was the second time in my life. I was too damn tired to stand it. I was too tired of fighting. My shoulders couldn't carry the weight any longer. My mind couldn't fight the fury. I was worn out and worn down. My life in Compton was a nightmare. The arguments, the fights, the beatings, they were torture. I was about to end it or someone's life. I stepped out of the Volkswagen. The gang members saw the shotgun and took off. 
I was disgusted and filled with rage. I went hunting and I do believe I would have killed every one of them that day if I had found them. Finally, exhausted, I went back to my VW and proceeded home. It took a while. There were police cars and an ambulance on Atlantic Avenue blocking traffic. I parked the VW to look at the cause. Lying dead in the middle of the street was one of the gang members who had beaten me. Gathered around his body were his friends and family. I heard the screams and cries of his loved ones. There was so much grief and pain. I had no idea what had happened, but at that moment, I knew I never wanted to cause that type of pain. I promised myself I would never take the shotgun out again. I did not want to kill anyone. If I got beat up again, they might kill me, but I would rather have that than kill one of them. The next day, I got to the tennis court. They were waiting for me. I went up to the gang leader and said, You know, you're much younger than I am. You think you could beat me? He said, I'll be honest with you. I'm scared of you. Man, if I start shooting you in your ass or hurt you, you the kind of nigga could die, come back, and hurt someone. No one's coming back, I said. He just looked at me. We both knew where it was going. I wanted the court. He wanted the court. Why don't you and I do this, I said. And if you see I'm getting the best of you, and before he could answer, I started to fight. I beat him for everything I was worth until he started yelling. Man, get this old devil off me. Get this old devil off me. Stop it, man. His boys pulled us apart. I didn't have to say anything. He and I both knew he would have to shoot me. It would take that to stop me. He shrugged and walked off and his boys followed. Was it respect or indifference or just convenience? I would never know. It had taken two years and almost destroyed my body and my spirit. But in that moment, none of that mattered. What mattered was the courts were ours. Context of white supremacy. We will pick up next week on chapter 19. I think we have, uh, if I had to guess, at least two more, maybe three, two, maybe three more uh, to go before we are all done with black and white the way I see it. Uh, If you would like to chime in, the number to dial is 760-569-7676. The code is 564-943-POUND. Press star 6 if you would like to participate. Should have about a good half hour. Uh, Folks uh, have things that they want to share. Uh, One of our listeners tweeted in uh, about the the whole, uh, is this an authentic representation of Mr. Williams' uh, spiritual spiritual nature, uh, the spiritual household that he raised uh, Venus and Serena in, as well as his other uh, daughters that uh, Orsine Price brought into their marriage? Uh, or is this the influence of the ghostwriter? Uh, one of our listeners, she tweeted in Richard Williams is a man of great faith, planning for children he didn't even have yet and caring enough to try to save Compton. Uh, those were her thoughts. Uh, I would say that might even uh, the fact that three of the children in the household were from a previous marriage. I think that might also speak to a pretty strong spiritual foundation. Uh, I think a lot of folks would say that that seems to be anomalous behavior uh, pretty frequently, even to this day. Anywho, uh, the folks uh, would like to dial in who have a hand up. Line should be open. We should have a good uh, 30 minutes uh, before the end of the program. Everybody who has a hand up, line should be open. Uh, this district 
particular uh, segment, uh, from what I've heard, uh, Mr. Williams shows a incredible uh, amount of courage. Uh, it's, it's no, it's, it, 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 to me, it makes it no wonder on why that these two young ladies, uh, uh, his two daughters, uh, are what they are today. Uh, just by that kind of example, I mean, what that's like, I mean, less than less than one percent of one percent of people will be willing to go to that length that extent uh, to risk their physical health uh, as well as their life for uh, the particular uh, goal that he had in mind I mean it's like I want to say almost insane but but uh, I mean, the, the, the incredible amount of courage that he, uh, and, and determination, you know, in other words, it's almost like, it seems like, hey, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to keep at this and you're going to have to kill me, uh, uh, because I, I am not, I am that determined to, uh, make this happen. And, uh, it's, I mean... I, I I would imagine I'm not I'm not uh, an expert on psychology. I, I I would imagine to the person who that would be challenged to, it would kind of like throw their their whole psyche uh, off when you dealing with a person who is who would not would not stop, would not quit, and at the same time you you you're just going to have to kill me. Because I'm going to continue to uh, uh, come out here on this park with my children uh, to do the things that I, I plan on doing. Uh, that's that, that's how that's what strikes me in this particular uh, segment of reading: the, the tremendous, tremendous amount of courage. Go ahead, next caller. Any uh, the other folks listening in have comments? Yes. May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. You still there? Oh, hi. Um, good evening. Uh, Gus, and good evening to the callers. And I am here. Can you hear me? Uh, it's breaking up a little bit. Um, I can I can hear you. It's just uh, doesn't sound like the best connection. Now I'm not hearing you at all. <laughs> I was hearing you. Now I'm not hearing you at all. Uh oh. Not sure if you're still there or not. I'm not hearing you. Yeah, right, it sounds like it cut off. Yeah, okay. it's not. So I'll be very brief. Um, we could hear you. Now we can't. <laughs> when you were saying you were going to be very brief, um, we could hear that, and then it cut out again. I don't know if you uh, stopped talking. Can you hear? Yep, we can hear you now. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'll, all right. I'll be very brief. Um, uh, the the level of depravity that the system uh, has uh, black people in that makes them want to steal the walker from an elderly person. Um, I just said it. I think that says like a lot about the system and Mr. Williams' courage to. Um, continue to fight uh, for what he wanted for his daughters after after seeing something like that. And um, I think he told Venus that he didn't want her to be around. Um, uh, I think he called them killers or malicious killers or something like that when he was describing the gang members. But um, 
unfortunately, she is around these people all the time as an adult through her career, but in a different form um, with the um, white people that she has to deal with, that they have to deal with um, as they're playing in, you know, and in their professional fields. But um, I just, uh, I agree with the previous caller, this uh, Mr. Williams' courage and his uh, tenacity and his, um, his uh, uh, drive to really do what he wanted to do for his daughters. If people really understood exactly what he had done. Cut out again. Cut out, if you're still there, cut out again. Uh, cut off if uh, people understood exactly what he's really done. And it cut out. You still there, caller? Still there? May I be heard? Okay. I, yeah. I am here. Yeah, if they had understood what he had done, um, then they would have a whole different view of him. That's all I had to say. Right on. Right on. The white guy said that, uh, I don't remember his name. I think his name was Richard as well, but he was doing the uh, interview, the BBC interview of Mr. Williams in uh, July of this past summer. And I think he said the same thing, that he he didn't have, he had a different understanding and appreciation for Mr. Williams, at least what he verbalized um, when talking to him and talking about some of the things in the book, as opposed to the way that he's generally represented. And uh, unfortunately, I think white people's commitment to racism, I think for a lot of white people, even getting this information uh, is not going to impact how they view him, his daughters, black people in general, uh, just, you know, nice story. They're still niggers. Um, I think he even says in, in the book um, that he, said he he never felt like a man he said he always felt like uh the way that white people treated him which was like a nigger and even that uh goes in my opinion right to mr fuller's uh code book about uh, not calling ourselves men men and women uh good to hear from Taiyi. should be with us as well do you have something you want to get in hi greetings gus and everyone on the call um yes i did i had a couple of points that i i wanted to um discuss I'll just add my quick feedback. Um, one of the callers, a male caller, right before the break, or right before the second segment, uh, made a comment about Mr. Williams' compassion towards the alcoholic people in his life as compared to the, the crack addicts and dealers. And um, during, having grown up in that area during that period of time, I just had a remark that I, I thought might lend some insight into that. Um, being around a person who's addicted to alcohol, you see that the um, tennis player was still a highly functioning person, even though he was dysfunctional. He was hurt, wounded, like a lot of people who've been abused. He had some issues, but there was still some kind of positivity. But when the crack epi epidemic hit, South Central Los Angeles and that area and mushroomed out from there, it was like it snatched people's souls. So, in my opinion, you had people that you could trust, people that you could close your eyes around that you could no longer <coughs> turn your back on. They would steal your shoes off your feet. And it, it changed people's consciousness. Like the, the older man that didn't like any black people. He didn't, He was afraid of black people because your life could be taken because the crackhead saw you pull $3 out of your pocket to buy a pack of gum. So it, I don't think that the, the lack of empathy that he showed was unwarranted. And even on the other side, the drug dealers completely lacked empathy. They had all this money. They had all this power. They were drunk on this power. 
and it was so negative and all the, the backbeat to everything was negative. Easy E's music, you know, started coming out and glorifying really, really bad behavior towards one another. And, you know, we all liked the music because it sounded good. It the lyrics, you know, you just, that was just sort of like, oh, okay, whatever, and, until you are developed enough to kind of reflect on, what, what did he just call me, a bitch? You know, and, and so... Um, that that's one point I wanted to make for that. Like, I, I can understand Mr. Williams' uh, seeming lack of empathy towards people who were addicted to or participating in the drug commerce because they were living, like, the full reflection of total psychopathy, and they didn't care about anything or anyone, and you had to protect yourself, and, and so that was something you would avoid and kind of despise. Um, the other thing was the, the idea that he, of him bringing his daughters there to raise them so that they would have that hunger, so they would have that mental toughness, you know, sort of fearlessness. And, you know, I can see the value of that, but I, I think that there is a risk and it's, got, it's a calculated risk and it's something that an individual would have to, you know, really think about because, you know, having come from that environment, I could say growing up in the just detailed, you know, um, destruction, just the, you know, from the walls being not painted, just the, anything you could think of, trash in the street, drugs, whatever, it, schools, old books, no books, you know, grow, growing up in that, can really instill a desire in you to not experience that anymore. And that, you know, given the right other variables in your life, that could lead you to be focused and put yourself, you know, to a higher, you know, position, to a more desirable position. And, but then on the other hand, you know, I, I raised a teenage son. I mean, he's almost an adult now, and um, I would... It, it didn't even cross my mind to raise him in that environment because I felt like as a big, tall, six-foot-something boy that the pull of that environment of what he would have to be to survive could, might be stronger than my influence on him. And so it, he could quite easily end up dead in the street. I have many, many close relatives. I have a... a nephew who was 21 years old who someone walked up to him after he beat them up, a, a person who was addicted to drugs, came and found him, walked up to him, put a shotgun to his chest, and shot a hole through his body. And I didn't want to expose my son, even though I could appreciate that being in an environment like that would lead you to be more, you know, because I see it in myself. You know, I have that drive that I, if you put an obstacle in front of me, I'm going to go figure out how to get to my goals. But, and I know that it has to do with going, dang, I don't like seeing this graffiti and stupid this I got to deal with and people rolling their eyes and you think you cute and just dumb stuff you have to deal with to get through your day. But then on the other hand, it, I can see my my son not having had that, you know, my more tar, got a little bit of bigger piece of cornbread, so... You can, you know, do some things that maybe I wouldn't have been able to do or not be exposed to that type of abuse in society. There's other kinds of, you know, racism and everything. There's other kinds of things you can deal with. But you don't see that same fire because it's just not there. Not that, you know, not that a child won't have interest if you put the right things in front of them. But it's not that same, like, oh, at all costs, you know, I'm going to achieve this goal. So, anyway, I, I, I just wanted to add, you know, that comment about those elements in the book. And thank you. I'll meet you later. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Uh, any of the other folks uh, have things they wanted to make sure they got in? Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you, Carla, for that uh uh, input there. Uh, back to the uh, the black man that he saw 
walking down the street that went on the other side of the street. And he asked him why he was dodging him. And he said, son, I come from Alabama. You see a black man, you get happy. Now when I see one, it scares the living shit out of him. And you black. It, it seems as though uh, Mr. Williams is reaching out to different individuals inside of the community. And also, uh, members of the gang, he, he said later on that he knew a few of them by name, so there were some exchanges and you know, some positive uh, interactions between him and individuals that live within that community. Uh, it, it just seemed to deteriorate as time went on. But I thought it was interesting that uh, the, the man would make that statement about uh, other blacks, and he said that, that's the only time that he had ever felt ashamed to be black. And then almost the next paragraph, I assume that the building that was on fire, the owner was a white man or some other nationality other than black because <coughs> Omar, Omar had made a statement that other nationalities was coming into the community and that very few or no blacks was owning any businesses then. And it just seems like that Mr. Williams regressed to a point to where he was chasing the thugs from Buddy's car wash. Now he wants to save the man, the owner's building from burning, and the owner himself is just sitting there watching it. And then... Uh, the owner ends up telling him that if you call the fire department or whatever, I'll lose money. So it was a it was an issue insurance scheme, and he was, you know, I guess playing, uh, you know, Mr. Goody Two Shoes again. He was going, you know, save somebody's business. But it just goes to show that he had uh, some type of uh, deep love or care for the community. And it was his desire to have the community a better place, you know, that drove him to do a lot of those uh, foolish things that uh, we find later on. Because, I mean, that's, that's quite a a lot to go through just to have your daughters practice on a tennis court. But I'll mute my line. Well, we got uh, roughly 12 minutes uh, to go. Um, just trying to balance, um, I think, what many folks have said, him sticking up for this uh elderly black male they were trying to steal his walker and uh different black male he's being beaten they've a lot of a <laughs> lot of kicking black people's teeth out uh in this week uh but they're beating this black guy down in the park in front of his daughters uh stabbing each other and everything and he goes to intercede um i thought Orisine um was presenting some pretty sound logic to say you know you easily could die out here doing this and then where would we be where would i be as a black mom with five children to take care of uh if you go out and die uh on these tennis courts or you know whatever else uh you're doing i mean that's in my opinion a very logical presentation uh even even this move uh from long beach to compton in this area where they're selling drugs in front of the house and shooting and and everything else uh just uh I don't know. That's uh, that's that's a big trade off. I think uh, one of our fem female cultists, I think Tai, she was saying that is that seems like a, a, a gamble. I think he even references it as saying that he was playing Russian roulette. And 
it was just a matter of time before things went bad. Um, and I mean, I would I would say your Tunde Price that is way worse than his his Christmas uh, anecdote of how he was ferociously beaten. I think he said that they kicked, uh, he lost ten of his teeth and they broke his ribs and everything else that happened. Uh, slashed the tires uh, on his vehicles. It just seems like uh, seems like a lot to sacrifice, uh, a lot to wager. I'll put it that way. It seems like a very risky wager. Um, in this gambit to toughen up uh, Venus and Serena. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to see how this how this uh, proceeds from there. Uh, the Christian element came up again. Uh, even in all this, he's again, uh, even if we don't want to call it Christian, uh, but certainly the spiritual element uh, came up again where he's saying that he felt protected. That's what he's telling his family. You know, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm fine. Uh, God has got my back. Um, are we are we saying what we heard in the second segment? Ghost Rider, or we think that's authentic? May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. I have a comment to that kind of thing. Um, my grandfather, I was raised by my grandparents, and my grandfather had that and I, that fearlessness. And I think it's because if you grew up where you had to deal with these group of white people defending your life every day, you, you can develop a pathology. I don't, my grandfather wasn't that extreme, but to give you an example, I heard something in the backyard one night, and he slept with a gun under his pillow. I ran, you know, somebody's in the backyard or something. He got up, got his gun. It's dark back there. Walked back there, and I'm begging him, don't go, don't go outside. You know, we have bars on the windows. We're we're okay if they're out. But no, he that's his house. He's going to go see. And I think that Mr. Williams kind of had swung to that extreme, like he got in that mode of I'm defending my life. I'm defending what's right. I'm defending what's right. And it became a pathology. <laughs> It seems right to me right now. I'll, I'll my eye. May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. What I think is interesting is um, he left Chicago and said that was a bad place, but here he is trying to make it with his family in Compton. I just think that's interesting. Also, um, I think Compton is a good example of racist interference um, slash genocide experiment. Um, Compton's interesting. The Bushes used to actually live in Compton in the late 40s and early 50s. And, you know, before the 80s, the crack 80s, um, you know, there's a lot of factories, there's a lot of middle class people, and there were a lot of nice houses, and, you know, black people were thriving and, and all of this, but, you know, crack hit and it just became this war zone. Um, I actually lived in L.A. for eight years, and I, and I was in L.A. in the 80s as a kid visiting, and all I remember is shootings and helicopters, and it just was really a war zone. Um, it just turned into a war zone. But one thing I appreciate about Mr. Williams, he kind of put Compton back on the map in a good way, you know, because it was known for these drive-bys and this war zone, and, you know, he kind of showed how, you know, something good can come out of Compton. It's kind of, you know, empowering black people who live there. So um, I just thought that was interesting. And if anybody thinks that, you know, him not leaving Chicago thinking it was bad and then ended up in Compton is kind of strange, um, you know, if anybody thinks that, like I kind of think that, um, let me know. <laughs> That's it. Um, yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Um, yes, I just wanted to point out that, it, it, you know, it kind of seems like a weird flag to me. Like, you know, y'all mentioning ghost writers and stuff. I never really thought about that, but um, they kind of sent the red flag to me when they were talking about he was speaking about his daughter when um he got to fighting. They said something said something about something about I gotta refresh my memory. Something about she put some gloves on or something. But um, he was 
referred to whoever did uh, he referred to uh, her smile as a devilish smile, and that kind of um stood out to me of all the words to say like a devilish smile kind of. We all said Ghost Rider, they kind of um, sent the red flag to me then. But um, I mute my line. I think that's the portion after he's uh, been fighting these folks uh, at the at the park. There's so many of these uh, incidents I'm trying to remember. I think it's, this is when he was fighting over the, the walker uh, that they took from the elderly black person. And uh, she says she wants to box. And he's telling her, you know, that you don't want to be fighting. Uh, just focus on your tennis and getting the best education you can. And I think that's when he, uh, it says that she had her, her devilish grin or smile and uh she said she wanted to get some boxing gloves gloves uh to to learn how to fight uh like him let's see uh we have about four minutes last four minutes anything stick out last four minutes uh that folks want to well, I think they referenced the the gang members referenced Mr. Williams as a devil as well uh, in the last confrontation uh, that he had where uh, the one black male said that he was afraid of him uh, because uh, he thought he was the devil. Uh, get this devil off of me. And he thought if he would killed him, he would come back and haunt him uh, afterwards. Um, even the uh, even the name of the original uh, gang member that he was citing who said was kind of ran. Uh, Compton at this time it was uh, evil two and evil one um those were were the names that were given i don't know if those uh, i'm sure they could have been pseudonyms i don't know maybe they those were the authentic names that they used at the time but uh, a lot of uh black people being referenced uh as devils devilish evil lots of that uh, you know i'd like to bring up one last point is that I found that up until uh, the 1960s, I guess, uh, maybe even uh, the late 60s, that Glendale, which is a portion of the suburbs of Los Angeles, not too far from Compton area, was all white. And it was purposely made all white, and they didn't even allow blacks in that particular area. So I think that we can't forget about the fact that a lot of these situations, Compton and the way that it ended up, it was purposely done like that. It was the, the whites that used to live there moved out. Uh, so they stopped the community improvement. The funds were cut off. Uh, the auxiliaries, the police, firemen and everybody else just didn't care anymore so you know you had what you had because of actions from white people moving and leaving uh that's that situation to deteriorate the way that it did mm -hmm. seems mr williams uh in the book, at least, he articulates some understanding of that, saying, again, talking about how uh, impotent the police were in that situation, uh, that their attitude was uh, let the niggers take care of themselves. Uh, and again, it was I just was a little bit ahead of myself with him saying that he thought that they were uh, in cahoots with the uh, drug trafficking that was happening. And uh, it would seem that that is accurate. Dark Alliance, it would seem he was accurate. Uh, anything else? Last quick comment before we wrap up something 30 seconds or less. Everyone satisfied? Everybody got in what they needed to for this week? Outstanding. Uh, we will pick up next week. Uh, we'll be on chapter 19. Uh, chapter 19 uh, for next Friday's segment. Uh, same broadcast time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, again, you can check out that documentary film, Venus and Serena. Uh, there is another documentary. I just can't remember the title of it, but it's a little bit older. 
um, that goes over, you know, a lot of the things that happen in their life. If I can recall the <clears throat> title, uh, I'll post it if uh, people want to check out. But it's got some great uh, archival uh, footage uh, of this uh, time period. Uh, I'll also see if I can check if they have uh, any significant footage uh, on uh, Yatunde Price uh, and see if that's in there as well. Um, last uh, quick comment, make sure I get in. Uh, one of our uh, investors, she wrote in, Mr. Williams is his mother's son. In my opinion, his decision to be in Compton was wrong thinking. Like he said, his mother had wrong thinking. He also had her faith. Um, it's her quick comment brief to the point um maybe next week we can get further detail uh what she means when she says uh, his mother's son i could extrapolate but i don't like to uh to assume um we'll pick up next week uh, as i said i think we'll have it'll be on display for the remaining remaining like 30 percent of the book uh in terms of this uh, spirituality faith however folks want to think about it whatever spiritual system is being uh displayed practiced in the Williams home. I think that'll be on display for the remainder of the book. We should have uh, two to three segments left before we hit the conclusion. Anywho, uh, we should be in tomorrow. Compensatory call in 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central and 6 p.m. Pacific. Tune in. We will review uh, news observations from the past seven days. Uh, workplace racism. Uh, if you all have anything that has stood out, things that you're looking forward to share, problems, solutions, new terms, concepts, <clears throat> definitely feel free to chime in. Uh, looking forward to hearing from folks tomorrow evening. Uh, the renewed unrest in Ferguson and Officer Wilson still not indicted. No surprise there. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Again, if you have uh, comments, you can tweet them out. We'll try and read them on the program at Until Justice at until justice you can also email them in and uh, we'll read them if you hear if you listen to the archives you can email your comments and then we'll just read them uh, for the book study session uh, next friday the email again until justice at gmail.com until justice at gmail.com i uh, hope folks are being safe uh, for uh, the beginning of autumn, and the weather has still been pretty spectacular in these parts. So I know for folks who are further south, uh, my suspicion must be that it is uh, pretty nice down there as well. I uh, hope you are being safe. Uh, if you are going to go out and do any frolicking this weekend, man, no alcohol sobriety would be best as whites are waging war against us. Sobriety would be best. Uh, but if you do have to consume any intoxicants, get to one spot and stay there. You can plan, pick a house, your house, whomever else has a residence. Go there, stay the night, and then the next day you can go do whatever you're going to do once you are sober once again. Uh, but if we hear people talking all the time, I don't know how many reports I've seen this week of people being out in a vehicle, even sometimes just pedestrians. They weren't even in a vehicle. And there was a suspicion uh, that they were uh, under the influence of cannabis uh, or that they had committed some kind of moving infraction and they weren't even uh, tipsy or anything. So you can imagine how much worse these situations would be if you have consumed some alcohol or if officers can use that to further justify their savage, brutish acts in terrorizing black people just Man, sobriety would be best. Sobriety would be best. Sobriety would be best. Uh, but if you can't get to one spot, stay there and then get back out in your vehicle where you can operate safely and minimize the likelihood of having any unnecessary problems with suspected race soldiers. Creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people other victims of racism, we ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to call on our ancestors to instill courage, strength, dedication to our assignment. Solving the problem, racist woman, Racist man, racist child, help us maximize black self-respect at all times in all areas of people, activity, 
help us display the highest levels of black self-respect each and every time we have contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice as soon as possible. Context of white supremacy. Signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. I'm a victim, brother. No problem. You're a victim. Right. I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm-hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. <laughs>